Alright, so today's webinar is entitled The Future of Analytical Psychology and the Future of the World. That's me, I'm Billy Dabrowski. I'll have just a short stint here at the beginning and of course we'll get our presenters online with you to start the, the main show and while we're all here. Uh, this is a relatively new series of programming for us. Uh, we do call them webinars. This is uh, a little different from our original series, which are entitled Video Seminars, which uh, go on live, usually from Zurich and then several other locations upcoming. Our video seminars are uh, three to five hours long and you know, high quality video, and like I say, usually coming from Zurich, and there are continuing ed credits that are available if that's something needed or you know, something that our audience is interested in. And then those become available in transcript form and DVD format thereafter, uh, usually a couple months after. Today's webinar is going to be a four-hour program. Uh, this should sound very nice. We've tested it uh, quite a few times, so hopefully we'll have a good audio presentation as well as I can tell you from looking at the slides that the PowerPoint presentation is very interesting. Uh, also, there is... Uh, CEU credits available here today if you signed up for that. Obviously, you know about it and the uh, appropriate information will follow after. And uh, aside from that, just to let everybody know, it looks like we've got about 50 people that had signed up uh, from the U.S. as well as six other countries. And I don't think everybody's going to be live watching it today, but uh, there should be quite a few people also watching the recorded version, so welcome to everybody. This is exciting to think of all these folks coming in from different countries and having a global experience surrounding the folks out in San Francisco. Uh, just a couple quick housekeeping issues uh, as far as audio and video settings are concerned. Make sure that you've clicked on the correct audio tab uh, to be able to hear correctly today. Uh, you've got two choices. You can either listen to us through the telephone, and you should have all of that information available to you as far as the number to dial in, as well as a uh, prompt for, a, I think it's a nine-digit code that you would have to enter to actually start hearing and participating. Uh, or you can just listen to it, of course, through your computer or iPad or whatever the device is that you're utilizing. Uh, your mic microphone is going to be muted, and uh, really... This is going to be the presentation coming out of San Francisco that we'll all be listening to and engaging in. So uh, there might be a chance for some questions from the online world, but more than likely we'll really just be listening and, and hearing the um, it's really fascinating presentation from the folks out in San Francisco today. Uh, please do engage your full screen mode. I think that would be best for everybody as far as the PowerPoint presentation is concerned. Uh, just to let everybody know, we do have a video seminar coming up from Zurich on March 8th, uh, about, a, about two weeks out. Uh, the folks in Zurich, uh, Dr. Murray Stein, I'm sure many of you have participated and viewed some of those presentations. Uh, he will be speaking on uh, the film A Dangerous Method, some of the historical aspects and kind of dissecting that film. It should be pretty interesting, uh, especially coming from the native Zurich. Uh, we are, it is necessary for us to go ahead and let everyone know that there is no commercial support for today's presentation, today's webinar. We have no commercial support for presenters, topics, or programs. There is no pharmaceutical industry support of any kind associated with us today. Uh, an online survey will follow up after uh, the presentation. Uh, it should come pretty quickly. And just so everyone knows, we are recording today. Uh, so, if in the event that there is an online question that comes up, please do not ask a question if you don't want your voice recorded. And today's presenters are Thomas Singer, Dr. Tom, Dr. Tom Singer, as well as uh, Dr. Craig Sandrock. And without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over, and we should get started here momentarily, but I'm going to turn over the microphone to Tom, and hope everyone enjoys. Thank you very much for participating and coming today. Ready? 
Yep, you're good to go, Tom. Okay, here we go. Um, this is like blast off. Uh, it's blast off for the Jung Institute because we've never done an event that has been both live and also simultaneously sent out around the world uh, to a number of people uh, interested in, in the kinds of things we like to talk about. And I think we have participants from Hong Kong and Argentina and Switzerland and Belgium. I'm probably leaving a few out. So, but the one thing, the, we certainly don't want this to interfere with your sense of participation and being here. And uh, as the audience, you're really primary. And I think that the webinar participants, whom we also welcome, will be able to ask questions via some sort of chat thing, and then we get it on the computer here. But um, so we, we, there may be some glitches and, 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 and whatever, because none of us are that familiar with this, although the, the people in Asheville who are doing the webinar are, uh, have really simplified it so that even Jungians can use it, which is uh, uh, kind of unbelievable. So I, I want to welcome all of you and thank you for uh, coming this morning. Uh, it's it's been it's very exciting for me because uh, Craig San Roque from Alice Springs, Australia, is here with us. And um, Craig and I met many years ago, and for the past decade, we've been collaborating on a series of projects. And I think there are four different books that that we've uh, worked on together in various ways. And I don't think I've seen Craig in 10 years, so, or a long time. So uh, our relationship is really a function of the future in a way that we work really closely and we have fun together. And we laugh, but we never actually see one another. And so, you know, really interesting. I did laugh when I met you again. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we've laughed a lot in the last few days because we've been spending really Wednesday, Thursday, Friday kind of walking around one another and our, our presentations, which I think we were delighted to find are really quite complimentary, and I hope you find the same thing. We, we do different things, and I'm, I'm doing what I see here in San Francisco, and Craig is doing what he sees down under, uh, and it's, it's a different perspective. So. That difference of perspective is what, in some ways, is, is most exciting about this. Now, we do have a door prize for anybody who can figure out the equation uh, that Craig has uh, artfully constructed. It's a hypothetical formula for survival. And I'll let Craig describe the various functions of that and the algebraic um, equation, although I said to Craig last night as we were uh, headed for bed, I said, you know, I actually don't think there's an equation. Um, I think usually an equation is something equals something else. But anyway. Oh, you were. <laughs> so anyway, our topic this morning, and let me just tell you how we're structuring this. Originally, Craig was going to do a presentation, and I was going to do a presentation, and Craig was going to do a second presentation, and then we were going to open it up for a good period of time for an audience discussion, because what's, what's clear in what we're doing is that none of us have the answers. And so it, what really makes it interesting is what everybody thinks. Our job is to really stimulate you to think and then tell us what you're thinking. We changed the order a bit uh, because of the nature of the material we actually ended up creating. So I'm going first because my thinking is more linear and straightforward than Craig's. He's very convoluted and upside down, as you will just <laughs> <laughs> well, Craig, Craig has an absolutely beautiful mind, and but our presentations, I, I think mine should go first because it's a more straightforward narrative, and then Craig is going to turn the whole thing around. So I'll speak for about an hour, and then we'll take a little break, and then Craig will speak, and we'll take a break in the middle of his speaking, and then and if anybody has a pressing question and gets upset or something urgent. Uh, we, we, I would welcome uh, an interruption. I'm not. I have something that I've worked out carefully, but I'm not wed to it. So, can we have that first slide, which the webinar already has? No, not that. Keep going. It's for the Asheville. Keep going down. This 
is all Asheville's. Okay. On the next one. Oh, there. Okay. Okay. Can you make that the full screen or not? The image? Okay. Okay. Well, anyway, this is my talk on the future analytical psychology and the world. My goal in this talk today, and the image here is from hanging out in space from the television series in 1950s, Tom Corbett, Space Cadet. And does anybody else here remember Tom Corbett, Space Cadet? I see one, just one. Well, anyway, we all start somewhere. Uh, my goal in this talk today is to get you as confused and disoriented as I have become in trying to think about the future. It is hard to imagine the future and what it holds in store for us, despite the fact that there are many who claim to know what's going to happen. Although we as Jungians like to think of ourselves as a pretty imaginative lot, I am not sure we are any better at predicting or imagining the future than anyone else, and I haven't seen much written about Jungian projections for the future, both for the world as a whole and for our profession. Although I do think Edinger had the notion that the Jungian tradition, at least the right kind of Jungian, would somehow constitute a saving remnant. When I was thinking about this, and maybe somebody knows differently, I don't think there's a lot that, in our tradition that talks about where we are now and where we're going. And I actually think it would be a terrific study for somebody who's got the energy to do an organized questionnaire and series of interviews with Jungians around the world in which the question about where we're going to be as a world and as a Jungian community 10 years from now, 25 years from now, 50 years from now, I think it would be just a tremendous study. And what would really be interesting to me is if there were a control group so that you could see if we think any, any, in any way we're different in what we imagine from the future than anybody else. So that's, that's a throwaway to some enterprising person who has more energy than I or Craig do. <clears throat> in the movie Call of Life, which I will be discussing in more detail in a few minutes, the point is made that as a species, human beings are not particularly good at long-term thinking, which is part of the reason that insurance companies make out like bandits. I think that's true. Not, most of us can't think about it, but they sure can. My own interest in speculation about the future, what we might think of as the early vestiges of my own primitive long-term thinking about the future, began when I was about eight years old watching Tom Corbett, Space Cadet. Change the slide, please. And uh, as only Wikipedia could do, I was able to go on Wikipedia and find an image of Tom Corbett's space cadet, whom I don't remember looking like that at all. I thought he was much younger. He looks old to me. And, and not only that, he's in color. And when we were watching Tom Corbett's space cadet, he was in black and white. So I'd never seen his actual royal blue outfit with that gorgeous belt, which looks like a world championship boxing belt or something. Um, Anyway, I was about eight, and I would watch Tom Corbett. He had a, he had a troublemaking sidekick named Roger Manning. And uh, I, I, when I was thinking about it, it was interesting to me because the shadow was already sort of in place in terms of the hero and the shadow kind of moving together in this early 1950s space odyssey. Of course, as an eight-year-old, I imagine that I was on the journey, perhaps even Tom Corbett, space cadet himself, but not the shadowy Roger Manning. Uh, those of you in the audience, and I think there was only one, one show of hands in that era, might have been on the same trip. Were you on the same trip, Steve? No, I was on the Flash <laughs> For the webinar audience, he wasn't, he wasn't even that into Tom Cord. He was into Flash Gordon. Since that time, I've done periodic reading in science fiction, of science fiction, cyberpunk, a form of near-term science fiction. How many people are familiar with cyberpunk? I'm just curious. Good number. I've seen countless movies and books, mostly fiction, which speculate about the future. I am by no means a futurist, just curious like most of you. I would ask you today to pretend that you, too, are part of Tom Corbett's Space Cadet team and that we are taking this little voyage into the future together. With this in mind, I want to 
start with a quote by William Gibson, who was really the founder of cyberpunk, and who in the 80s actually coined the phrase cyberspace. So William Gibson was there before all of us in many ways. And here, here's what he writes about science fiction, which I think, or, or the future, which I think is really sort of central to what we're going to be talking about today. Alvin Toffler warned us about future shock, but is this future fatigue? The past decade or so, the only critics of science fiction I pay any attention to, all three of them, have been slyly de declaring that the future is over. I wouldn't blame anyone for assuming that this is akin to the declaration that history was over and just as silly. But really, I think they're talking about the capital F future, which in my lifetime has been a cult if not a religion. People my age are products of the culture of the capital future. The younger you are, the less you are a product of that. If you're 15 or so today, I suspect that you inhabit a sort of endless digital now, a state of atemporality enabled by our increasingly efficient communal prosthetic memory. I also suspect that you don't know it because as anthropologists tell us, one cannot know one's own culture. The future, capital F, be it crystalline city on the hill or radioactive post-nuclear wasteland, is gone. Ahead of us, there is merely more stuff, events, some tending to the crystalline, some to the wastelandy stuff, the mixed bag of the quotidian. Please don't mistake this for one of those after the deluge moments on my part. I've always found those appalling, most particularly when uttered by aging futurists, whom all people should know better. This newfound state of no future is, in my opinion, a very good thing. It indicates a kind of maturity, an understanding that every future is someone else's past, every present someone else's future. And Craig will really be picking up on this in a, in a wonderful way, as you'll see. Upon arriving in the capital F future, we discover it invariably to be the lowercase now. The best science fiction has always known that, but it was a, a sort of cultural secret. When I began to write fiction at the very end of the 70s, I was fortunate to have been taught as an undergraduate that imaginary figures are always, regardless of what the authors might think, about the day in which they're written. <coughs> Orwell knew it writing 1984 in 1948, and I knew it writing Neuromancer, my first novel, which was published in 1984. If you're not quite clear what Gibson is saying, but think that he is on to something, we are starting on the same page. Among other things, he is warning that those who pontificate on the capital F future are actually talking about the present, and that the capital F future is disappearing anyway because the digital age is making everything now. Gibson believes that with digitization, a younger generation is learning to live in a perpetual now in which past, present, and future are more or less the same. I mean, I sort of experienced that when I went to look for Tom Corbett's space cadet, and there he was. He was actually even more alive because he was in color. And I really couldn't remember him. He didn't look anything like I imagined, but there he was. Let me add one more quote from Gibson to this mind-boggling brew, because those of us who have long been interested in that part of Jung, who turned his attention to what we call the collective psyche, will find that Gibson's observation confirms what we have intuited for some time, that the collective psyche is alive and well and changing rapidly. Gibson writes, and I think he is dead on, the human species is in the process of growing itself an extended communal nervous system. We may not clearly see how we are changing, but we are already the Borg. And for those of you who don't know what the Borg is, the Borg is some imaginary time in the future when humans are part human and part machine computer. What he's saying is that we actually are already the Borg. I would argue that the collective psyche existed long before we began to develop our current form of the extended communal nervous system through the internet, Twitter, Facebook, at all. But the addition of these techno-neural connections is indeed altering the collective psyche itself. 
In fact, they are responsible for the fact that Craig and I are here today because we have done virtually all of our work together on four books in the past decade via the Internet. A whole new era of Jungian exchange and evolution, including our new book, Placing Psyche, a collaborative study by many people who live far away from one another, is flowering because of the extended communal nervous system. The fact that others in the world are listening to us right now on the webinar of this meeting, listening to this meeting, testifies to this rapidly changing phenomena in the collective psyche. Now, as Gibson would say, let's press the reset button. And rather than initially try to go forward in time, go backward in memory. Just about 100 years ago, can I have the next slide, please? Wait, yeah, OK. Gibson was, uh, just about 100 years ago, in 1913, Jung was having visions about Europe being flooded with blood and, then the, and the onset of another ice age. This image from the Red Book gives us an idea of the inner and outer psychic forces that Jung was experiencing. Now, what I've done with some Red Book images is I've not tried to place them in any particular time when they were done or how they might fit into the Red Book. But these are the images that popped out to me when I was thinking about this paper. So I'm using Jung's images in my own way. And somebody may say, well, that's not what this picture is about. And, and that's just fine with me, because I'm responding to the archetypal material in the images in relation to the material that I'm talking about. I think we'll all be doing that with the Red Book for a long time. Jung became fearful that he was on the verge of a personal psychosis until the outbreak of World War I allowed him to see with some relief that his visions had been a response to the unconscious collective psyche rather than to a personal problem. Of course, that also contributed to his suspiciousness of the collective psyche as well as his keen interest in it. The world of 100 years ago was on the verge of catac cataclysmic changes in every dimension of life. Two world wars, one Great Depression, and the explosion of the atomic bomb came in the 50 years following Jung's terrifying visions. And after that, another more subtle explosion has occurred, but one which may turn out to be equally cataclysmic. Mass marketing and global consumerism have arrived with a vengeance that has turned much of the world's population into consumers with insatiable appetites rather than citizens concerned rather than citizens concerned with it and engaged with their communities. Of course, Jung was not alone in such terrifying premonitions for the future in the early part of the 20th century. One only needs to think of H.G. Wells, who was actually described as the father of science fiction, and the nightmares that he anticipated for humankind in deeply dire books such as The Time Machine and War of the Worlds. In the film Matter of Heart, Marie-Louise von Franz talks reluctantly of a simple diagram which Jung allegedly scribbled on his deathbed in June 1961, which Tom Kearse tells me some people say that she actually made that up and there was no scribbled final note. But for the sake of today, whether it's science fiction or historical fiction, we're going to assume it's real. And she said that she stuffed this Jung's final diagram into a bedside drawer. The diagram was drawn closely to 50 years after Jung's terrifying vision 1913. As he was dying, Jung saw humanity as having no more than 50 years left, despite the fact that the 1950s had given birth to one of the most prosperous eras in human history. Nevertheless, as von Franz describes it, Jung's last drawing essentially straight lines the human enterprise in the way that an electrocardiogram goes flat when the heart stops beating. Just a flat line. We are now 50 years down the road from Jung's deathbed vision and 100 years down the road from his vision of Europe covered in blood. The euro is not giving us much reason for hope at this moment. And if we take Jung's deathbed vision literally, our time has literally run out. Yet we are assembled here today to imagine what the huge future holds for the world in analytical psychology. And let's assume that we have another 50 years, at least for the purposes of this discussion. What can we imagine of the future knowing that whatever we say may or may not be true? And I always admire Joe Henderson's attitude. People would ask him when he turned 100 and 101, 102, 103, 104, what he thought was on the other side of uh, death. 
And he always refused to answer that question because he said, I don't know. I haven't been there yet. And when I cross that threshold, maybe I'll know. So he refused to speculate about his own future after death. And I, I, I always liked that because one expected, he was such a wise old man, that one expected him to know, as one might come here expecting Craig and I to know something, which we don't, about the future. Um, <clears throat> Anyway, keeping that unknowing in mind, I want to give a few scenarios for the future that have caught my attention recently. I'm sure everybody here is going to have their own favorite scenarios of what they imagine the future to hold for us, but these are, these are some that have really caught my attention. And there's always been a large spectrum of projections for the future which have ranged from the most positive to the most negative. Can we have the next slide, please? At the positive end of the spectrum, one might include everything from a materialist, technological, utopian vision of heaven on earth to a spiritual alternative universe such as the crystalline city, or even though it takes surviving the last judgment, a place of divine perfection where the righteous who survive the last judgment will sit at the white throne of God and shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. This is uh, that white throne of God and after the last judgment are doing it by William Blake. The other end of the spectrum would be the final annihilation of mankind and the planet without any post-apocalyptic existence at all, including life on other planets or solar systems. Today I want to take a few of the scenarios for the future which fall somewhere in between the extremes of the spectrum. The next slide, please. Just a month ago, I participated in the screening and discussion about the film Call of Life. It presents the growing consensus among the world's most distinguished biologists. We are now in the early phases of the sixth great mass extinction event in the planet's history. The last great mass extinction event was 65 million years ago when 95% of the Earth's life, including the dinosaurs, became extinct apparently as a consequence of a large asteroid slamming into the Earth. The forecast by the most reputable biologists for the next 50 years is that 50% of all the species of animal and plant life on Earth will become extinct. Let me repeat that because it is staggering to try and take in, that 50% of all the species of animal and plant life on Earth will become extinct in the next 50 years not because of some imagined extraterrestrial event, because of the activity of human beings. In trying to digest this indigestible forecast, I found myself looking at this image from the Red Book. Next, next image, please. Through the lens of the movie's title, Call of Life, and thinking of this as Jung's own version of the Call of Life. We are losing species at somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 times the normal rate of extinction in evolutionary time. What will the planet be like 50 years from now if 50% of all the Earth's plant and animal life is extinct? What will the practice of analytical psychology be like if that scenario unfolds? Call of Life makes the very interesting point that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk and would like to highlight again. As a species, we are not good at long-term thinking. This is simply a fact of the evolutionary development of our brain, its capacity to think in long-term time frames, long-range time frames. Maybe that's why we can hardly begin to think about what it means for the world if half of all the Earth's living species will have disappeared in the next 50 years. But it does make Jung's deathbed diagram seem plausible. Clearly, we are going to have to, th we're going to, have to hurry up and make some evolutionary leaps at long-term thinking if we are going to be able to actually think about what this mass extinction means and how we are going to cope with it. Now, can I have the next slide, please? I'm going to go just in the opposite direction, which came to me in reading a Wall Street Journal article in late January of this year, which predicts the coming tech-led boom that will revolutionize life on the Earth. 
And it says, and it, and it starts with a narrative in 1912, just a year before Jung's visions, but it goes in just the opposite direction. Listen to this. In January 1912, the United States emerged from a two-year recession. Nineteen more followed, along with a century of phenomenal economic growth. Americans in real terms are 700% wealthier today. I don't know what real terms are, but we're 700% wealthier today. In hindsight, it seems obvious that emerging technologies around 1912, electrification, telephony, the dawn of the automobile age, the invention of stainless steel and the radio amplifier, would foster such growth. Yet even knowledgeable contemporary observers at that time failed to grasp their transformational power. And then he goes on to say that in, in January 2012, we sit again on the cusp of three grand technological transformations with the potential to rival that of the past century. They also point out that all of these major technological advances are centered in the United States. This is a Wall Street Journal article. So they're not thinking globally particularly. They're thinking about the state of the union and where we're going to go. The first revolution is in big data. And big data is sort of connected to the cloud and the fact that they're going to be the capacity to crunch data in a new way, what they call metadata analysis, will lead to astronomical feats of data crunching, which will enable heretofore unimaginable services and business, the ability to handle data. Second is the revolution in smart manufacturing. And this is really quite amazing because there, there are new materials literally being invented all the time. My neighbor, next door neighbor, is involved in something called graphene. And graphene is this very thin molecular uh, uh, substance that allows uh, tremendously rapid uh, uh, electrical transmission such that it will make our current silicon chips seem uh, prehistoric. I read two weeks after reading this article that uh, they, somewhere in the United States and Australia, I think, they have, made, they have succeeded in making a single atom into a transistor. So that we're going to have new materials that we can't imagine, some of which will make objects invisible. The goal, what they call the, what do they call this, the, uh, the holy grail of smart ma manufacturing is when you will have a computer that can print out in three-dimensional new objects, dishwashers, automobiles. So apparently, sort of new materials and new computing processes will allow the manufacturing to be done on, a, on a, some kind of 3D computer, whatever that is. And third, there is the unfolding communications revolution, where soon most, most humans on the planet will be connected wirelessly. Never before of a billion people, soon billions more have been able to communicate, socialize, and trade in real time. And this is what William Gibson refers to as the communal neural network. So the, uh, the implications of low-cost wireless connectivity, which we're participating in today, are as big as those following the dawn of telegraphy, telephony in 1912. So you compare the first two scenarios that I've given you, the fact that we are entering the sixth mass extinction event in the history of the planet, and the fact that we are on the verge of a technology manufacturing boom that will revolutionize the world as we know it. It reminds me of the first joke I heard, the first joke I remember hearing, again, as an eight-year-old. In writing these things and some other papers I've, I've done, I realized that everything seems to begin for me when I was eight. I don't know why, but that's... Uh, it seems rather late developmentally, but at least, at least the fun things that I remember, and I think it has to do with latency and when the mind was able to kind of be freed up and start to uh, speculate and travel with Tom Corbett and people like that. So anyway, one day I was at the home of a close friend in my neighborhood, and his mother asked us if we knew the difference between an optimist and a pessimist. I suspect most of you have heard this joke one or another. Well, we didn't know what that, the words meant. We didn't know the difference. And she went on to tell us that there were two brothers, maybe twins, who one Christmas morning came racing downstairs to open their presents beneath the Christmas tree. The pessimist was the first to spot his present, a beautiful brand new bicycle with all the most modern gears and every device. And he scoffed at it, pointing out all the things that were wrong with it. 
He was the pessimist. The optimist then saw his present, a large burlap bag. He opened it up and with great joy exclaimed, Mommy, guess what? Santa Claus brought me a horse, but he ran away. It was filled with shit, the burlap bag. <laughs> it... <laughs> Silly jokes, you remember, but the, the pessimist can't see the good that is right in front of him, and the optimist doesn't see the bad that is right in front of him. So if you think of these two scenarios of the entering the sixth mass extinction event and a revolution in technology and manufacturing, you know, you can be a pessimist and say, you know, the world is going to be unrecognizable in terms of its devastation, or you can say the world is going to be amazing and the new things that we're going to, the quality of life we're going to have, the quality of the nine instead of six billion people on the planet will have. So you, you really can go either way, and maybe it varies from day to day, although most of the time I find myself a little bit more on the pessimistic side. I want to go on to the next image and the next scenario. I'm going to present five scenarios, I think, or four. This is a, an, this is the poster from the movie The Road. I'm curious how many people either read the book or saw the movie. Oh, good. Um, this is more in line with the apocalyptic catastrophe of mass extinction. Uh, it comes to me, came to all of us through literature. And a lot of our ideas about the future do come through literature, through fiction. Jules Verne, H.G. Wells, George Orwell, Aldous Huxley, B.M. Gibson, Neil Stevenson, Haruki Murakami. The Road by Cormac McCarthy moved me deeply in its evocation of a post-apocalyptic future because it is so tinged with what senses to be McCarthy's profound weariness with the present. He's very weary. He has written a book that is as bleak and disturbing as anything I've ever read. It is told with such tender feeling that I found it as beautiful as it is horrible. A father and son wander down a road populated by endless and impersonal cannibalistic terror. While their bond of human love unfolds with a rare sensitivity and inexorability. The book has so touched a nerve in my psyche for the past few years, I often feel as though I am living in, a parallel, in parallel universes, my everyday life of 2012 and my life on the road. I find myself imagining a world without electricity, cars, hot water, enough food, and the constant threat of human beings that have lost all their humanity. I debate whether or not to buy a gun to protect my family, because at times I can almost feel the meltdown of the road occurring. As, as all of us Jungians know, when you start to write and think like that, you're going to gonna be a payback. And last night I got my payback at uh, 2 in the morning when the, uh, we had a big storm and the electricity went out and my computer blew up and all of my images went down. And I thought, I'm on the road a little earlier than I wanted. Um, and I really did, I said to Craig this morning, I think that's, what you, that's the price you pay when you start thinking this way. <clears throat> Hopefully I'm just a little bit like Jung, and this does not represent the onset of a personal paranoia, but a reaction to a growing potential in the collective psyche. Um, next slide, please. Are any of you familiar with the historian Tony Jute? Uh, well, he's, he is sensationally brilliant. He wrote a book about the history of post-World War II Europe, which is just absolutely brilliant. And he is a brilliant man who apparently developed a progressive and fatal neurological disease. Um, and he died a few years ago, I think. But in the last six months before his death, and he knew he was dying, he had a collaborator or a co-worker, and he insisted on getting this book, Ill Fares the Land, uh, done. He, he, this was his final message, and Ill Fares the Land is really about the United States. It's also about the world, and it's about the increasing divide between the rich and the poor, and the consequences that ha that has for various societies. 
And what you see in this first slide is the relationship between the inequality of um, resources, finances, and the quality of health. The less resources, the greater the divide, excuse me, the greater the divide between rich and poor, the worse the health is of a given population. And if you look at that, if you look at this, this slide, which is absolutely astonishing, if you look at where the USA is on this graph, it's, and these are Western, these are Western industrialized countries. The United States is literally off the chart in terms of the price we're paying in terms of the quality of our health. It's a function of the inequality between rich and poor. Growing inequality. And the next slide, please. Are they? I'm sorry, I don't know. Well, let me just. So on this line is the um, income inequality. And on this line is an index of health and social uh, problems. And what you see is in every country, the greater the income inequality, the higher the rate of problems in health and the quality of living. And each of these are the countries listed here. And the United States is up here. So the discrepancy between income, income inequality and quality of health is the worst in the United States. But in every country, it increases the greater the divide between rich and poor. Yes, physical health. It's a, that's the index, physical health. If we can go to the next slide, which is really the same point, but it's related to crime. Same thing. The greater the divide, but in, the greater the inequality in income or wealth, the higher the rate of crime in all of the Western industrialized countries. But the United States is by far almost off the chart in terms of being worse. I hope that makes the point clear. And homicide, excuse me. <clears throat> There's a movie, I don't know if you saw The Children of Men. Yes? The, the question is, which country is on the lower end? And it's Japan. Japan, Norway, Denmark, Belgium, Canada, Italy, Portugal, Singapore, and the USA. Of course, Singapore is the most organized, functional place in the world right now. Yes? Actually, I don't understand the question. The question is, is it crime or criminalization? Yes. This, this is homicide. This is actually about homicide. So the rate of homicide increases, and it doesn't tell us whether the, the poor are are committing homicide more often than the rich, or they're getting caught and punished for more. It doesn't tell us. It just says the rate of homicide in a given country. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Just for the webinar people, I'm just going to say that there's a comment that incarceration is also reflective of the same phenomenon. The United States has a very high rate of car incarceration relative to other countries as well. Yes? The question is, could you look at education as a variable and a mitigating factor? And I'm sure you can. And I, frankly, I don't know what Tony Jew did with that, but I can recommend his book to you. It's called Ill Fares the Land. I, I really chose this not because, obviously it stimulated a lot of interesting questions, and people want to know more about it. And, and the book is, a, is wonderful, and maybe it can help tease that out, because he gives all the sources of this information. Um, so the, the final uh, scenario, 
I'm going to do. Can you uh, go to the next slide, please? So this is WALL-E by Pixar. This is the final example of my tour of future scenarios. And I would, I'd rather be a bit optimistic and, and end this section on a positive note. So I chose WALL-E. To put it another way, to be like the brother on Christmas Day who embraced the burlap bag filled with shit, the horse that got away. WALL-E is a futuristic Pixar movie about a long space journey to escape a massively destructive event on Earth. Eventually, the ship is increasing, it, of increasingly obese space cadets. I think that's where the present and the future get, get really mixed up. What you see on the spaceship, which is supposed to be occurring over many, many generations, is because the people are confined to a spaceship, get more and more obese. I think the producers of Pixar were really saying something about the present. Anyway. The, the spaceship is turned around by the efforts of Wally, who is both sort he's a Borg. He's a Borg. He, he's a computer, but he's a computer with human qualities in that he has feelings and empathy, and he's very responsive to what we consider to be most human. So he, he, can, he creates a situation on the spaceship. Jung died 50 some years ago, 50 years ago. And I'd like to refer you to a, a paper that Tom Kearse recently did, which in a really succinct and lovely, deceptively simple uh, form, describes some of the major changes that analytical psychology has undergone for the last 50 years. We don't necessarily think that often or that much about ourselves as an evolving tradition, or even um, what we're evolving in response to. That's part of this discussion today. What can we anticipate in the future and what we, what we might have to become if we're, gonna, if we're gonna have a meaningful role to play in the future. There are two major trends that Tom pointed out in his paper which, which are meaningful to me. One is that the Jungian tradition now is a much broader tradition. It's a much broader umbrella than it was 50 years ago. We now have a developmental, a strong developmental part of our tradition. We have a strong clinical part of our tradition. Uh, we have a strong um, class, so-called classic 
part of our tradition, whatever that is. And, uh, and we have a so-called uh, archetypal tradition as well, sort of an image-based tradition a la Hillman. So we have all these different traditions that are really truly under one umbrella now. And most of us actually uh, may identify with one more than another. But in fact, we're moving back and forth between all of them most of the time. Um, and that's been very, that I think has been very positive. We have a very broad spectrum in terms of those people who are, you might say, the, the new age of doctors who take up Jungian ideas, Jung's ideas, and apply them in some ways that are uh, unrecognizable to more traditional Jungians. And there are Jungians on the other end of the spectrum who really don't think, don't think you're individuated unless you've had many years of analysis and that you're familiar with alchemy and dream interpretation and and so on. So we have. We have, we have a strict tradition, and we have a looser tradition. And they're all under that same umbrella. And we're all trying to swim through that to sort of determine where we are at any given time. <clears throat> the, other, the other point that Tom makes, which I think is really true, is that uh, the Jungian tradition, in a way, and it's a paradox, thrived on being marginalized. And in some ways, we learned to love the fact that we were outside the mainstream. And uh, because the Freudians really established themselves as dominant, in the United States at least, uh, Jungian psychology, analytical psychology, did not get into the universities, did not get into the medical centers, did not get into the residency training programs. So all the sort of traditional ways in which one might be trained as a psychiatrist or a psychotherapist the Jungian tradition was really marginalized. And we took some pride in that over time. And um, we, we learned to take that on as part of our identity. And there was a dream I had in, um, in the late 60s, which I, I think sort of speaks, it's sort of been my orienting uh, point of view about this topic. I dreamt I'd entered a large indoor public pool filled with people. Then I noticed a small door at the back of the building where there was a separate, smaller pool which belonged to the Jungians. Remember from the dream that the people at the Jungian pool looked really weird. <laughs> so, so here we are in our Jungian pool, and probably to a lot of people driving down Gulf Street, we look really weird sitting around talking about Wally and the road. <laughs> We are probably still marginalized, but we're a lot less marginalized. But the other truth, I think, is that we've become much closer to our first cousins, the Freudian, both because I think we've seen lots of affinities that weren't recognized early on, and in fact, real commonalities in sharing very, very similar points of view on many things. But I think part of that bonding is that we're sensing that we're dinosaurs. And we didn't go out with the fifth mass, mass extinction event, but we may go out with the sixth mass extinction event. And I think the Freudians and the Jungians have a pretty keen sense that, although in some ways we're thriving, our international organization has two or 3,000 analysts, and I think our training programs are doing reasonably well. So we're a growing tradition, but I think we're a growing tradition very much um, concerned, legitimately concerned about our future. Can I have the next slide, please? So um, this is um, this is my favorite uh, drawing diagram from Jung. It was done in 1926, and it's a diagram of the psyche. It's done by Jung and recorded by somebody in one of his seminars, and I love it because it's it's really funky. But it's got it's got Jung's idea of the layering of the psyche. This is a dream of this is a dream. This is a diagram of the psyche, but it's got both evolutionary and geological components built in. So you can see Jung thinking about this the place of the human being in our development, the development of the earth in geological time and in evolutionary time. So he puts the individual up there as just a little little thing on top of the, just above the surface of the water. And all the rest, which have to do with families, and then clans, and then 
uh, larger groups, including nations, and then maybe what he calls larger groups of, of people, which are like the European man. And then he goes to, I think, our, our primate ancestors, then to um, other animal ancestors. And finally, he gets down to the central fire, which always intrigued me, the central fire. But this is Jung's idea of the psyche. This is Jung's idea of the, of the vastness of the human psyche that I think he, he truly felt. And obviously, in the Red Book, it's all alive inside of us. This is an inner world that he's describing here. So I tried to take Jung's diagram of the psyche. Can I have the next slide, please? And I tried to imagine the changes that are going on now in terms of its impact on the psyche and obviously on the um, practice of analytical psychology. A lot of these things are very, very familiar to us. Uh, but I just thought, I just had fun. I sort of said, OK, what would Jung do with the psyche and the kinds of changes that we're anticipating, fearing, how they're going to impact both the psyche and our practice of analytical psychology. And so I started with some of the most obvious. I started with insurance. For those of us who practice analytical psychology, we're keenly aware of the impact of insurance and how it affects the way in which we go about our business. Now we can, we can go back to our marginalized existence in which we simply refuel, refuse to deal with insurance companies. Most of us, or a lot of us, can't afford to do that. We earn a living doing this practice. And unless we're very well thought of in our community, um, we need to do other things rather than classical Jungian analysis to survive. We see all kinds of people, and we do all sorts of things. We're often involved with insurance companies who are constantly pressuring us to provide less and less care for less and less money using more and more drugs. That's just a fact, and we all know it. We don't talk about it very much, but it's a fact and has a tremendous impact on our profession. Maybe not on Jungian psychology, but certainly on the practice of analytical psychology as a clinical tradition. The, the most interesting, I think, change, and of course, Jung was not against pharmacology. I mean, he clearly early on when he's writing about schizophrenia, he thinks it's probably going to turn out to be some sort of chemical imbalance, and there will be a a meaningful treatment of it. I know I've seen people who have had severe obsessive compulsive disorders who, in an older era, would have spent 15 years on a Freudian couch and 10 years talking to us and probably not making any progress. If you give them certain pharmacological agents, they'll be better in six weeks. So you know, we can sit here as the marginalized Jungians and complain about psychopharmacology. In fact, for many of us, we've seen how miraculous it can be. We've also seen how it can be misused and how really the, it sounds as though the whole world is over-medicated at this point by people who don't understand the medications and don't understand the use of them. But psychopharmacology has a huge impact on our practice, as does neurobiology. Now, we can, we can get, be afraid of neurobiology because it seems to be such a concretization of psyche. It's sort of an ultimate materialist fantasy, which every Jungian dreads, which is that you reduce everything to neurons or the relationship between neurons. So it's, it's reasonable that we're afraid of that part of neurobiology, which would, which would reduce all of what we think of as psyche to, to matter. We, we would not accept that. On the other hand, I firmly believe, that, and I think Jung believed, that ultimately analytical psychology was how the psyche appears to us inside and outside. We don't see molecules when we think about the psyche. So analytical psychology is about the psychology of being a human being. And neurobiology is about the biology of being a human being. And they're not opposites, although they can frequently be played off against one another, as if they will. But they're really two parts of the same. And the sooner we kind of embrace that, the better off we are. And I think of this specifically in terms of the idea I've been working on, which is the cultural complex theory. I'm convinced, I may be wrong, but I'm convinced that in time, and not very long, 
you're going to get trigger words for certain complexes, cultural complexes, group complexes, be able to bring somebody into a neurobiological laboratory and hook them up to various devices that measure brain waves and actually can track what's going on inside the, in the brain. And you're going to start to see a wiring for what we call cultural complexes. There will be a linking of affect, there will be a linking of memory, there will be a linking of cognition, and there will be a linking of behavior. And it's got to be in the brain, if you think about it. It's also in the psyche. It's both. So I, I don't think we should be afraid of neurobiology. I think we should embrace it while holding our own point of view. Yes? I think that if I think that neurobiologists have laboratories where they're actually able to see various parts of the brain activated in various circumstances. And so they can identify memory pathways. They can identify pathways of affect or emotion. And I think that what will happen is you'll get people to have what I call a cultural complex or what we call individual complexes. You'll be able to get trigger words. And you'll give somebody a trigger word that's going to activate a complex in them. And you're going to see parts of the brain light up that link memory and affect and cognition and behavior. And what we call a cultural complex or a complex is simply going to be demonstrated at its material biological level. <laughs> the benefit is the curiosity of being human and knowing that what you've spent 100 years thinking about has a biological basis. I think that's valuable in itself. Maybe, huh? Is that fair enough? I mean, and also, and also, potentially, it allows to meaningful intervention, not the control of the human species, but the understanding of how, listen, cultural complexes tear nations and clans and tribes apart. Once you get into that stuff, it is so destructive. If we can find ways to defuse the affect, the autonomous, destructive behavior that's activated, then, you know, maybe we'll have a brave new world. Thank you. It's, it's a very good topic, and I, what I'm afraid of here is I, I want us to have a conversation, but I also want to, if we can, include the webinar people. So, if, and we'll open it up, and then when we open it up, it'll be a little bit like an open mic. If you have a comment, you can come up here and talk to me or to Craig, and then other people can hear us. Now, maybe that'll work and maybe it won't, but that's our trying to adapt to what we're doing. But, let me just move on. These are really, really good questions. I mean, what's the, what's the purpose of learning about the brain and the relationship between the brain and analytical psychology? What are we going to do with it? What do we learn from it? What value is it to us? It's a very, very good question. Actually, you know, we don't know. We can imagine various uses. Yeah, that's right. So really what we need to do is get every fundamentalist in the world in this room and deprogram. <laughs> I 
Let me let me move on. I'm being silly, but uh, these are things that are going to affect us. But now I want to ask a series of questions, which are in that diagram to the right, further down. I'm not sure if you can see them. I, I I've I've talked about obvious current trends in the future: insurance, psychopharmacology, neurobiology. Now I want to ask a series of questions. How will the predicted growth in the world's population from 6 to 9 billion in the next 50 years affect the psyche and analytical psychology? How will changes in the world's climate and ecology affect the psyche and analytical psychology? How will the sixth mass extinction in the planet's history affect the psyche and analytical psychology? How will the increasing role of technology and the communal neural network affect the collective psyche and analytical psychology? <clears throat> How will the increasing economic, social, and political divide between have and have-nots in a world where that divide is made visible every day to everybody around the world by mass communication affect the psyche, the collective psyche, and analytical psychology? And if you look at Jung's map of the psyche, what you're going to see is most of these questions take place between C through H, really all at the level of being part of a tribe, being part of a nation, being part of the species. I mean, everything that we're talking about really are, these are mass effects that we're talking about. And the individual will obviously be affected, but they're coming in at much deeper levels of the psyche. They're just going to, I mean, there's just no way of avoiding that. The, the, the psyche is being bombarded by massive changes, massive changes that we can only begin to outline today. The answer, I, I don't pretend to have the answer. I'm simply trying to frame the issue, if you will, and give you a, a bit of a map in which to imagine uh, where these things might affect what Jung described as the psyche, in which most of us uh, except to one degree or another. Yes. I was asked to repeat the questions. How will the predicted growth in the world's population from 6 to 9 billion in the next 50 years affect the psyche and analytical psychology? How will changes in the world's climate and ecology affect the psyche and analytical psychology? How will the sixth mass extinction in the planet's history affect the psyche and analytical psychology? How will the increasing role of technology in the communal neural network affect the collective psyche and analytical psychology? How will the increasing economic, social, and political divide, some may argue that it won't be a divide, that our new technological revolution will lessen the gap between have and have nots. You can make an effective argument for that, I think. But right now, it looks as though there's an increasing divide. How is that going to affect the collective psyche and analytical psychology, particularly when it's evident to everybody in the world that that's what's happening? That's why Occupy Movement is so interesting to me. And then what I said is that all of these changes are taking place in C through H of Jung's diagram. Now, I'm going to make a few concluding remarks. Um, as long as there's a human species, we must believe that there will be a psyche and soul. This means there will be some place for our tradition, whatever it evolves into. And evolve it must. I believe that we must, as a group and a tradition, find a way to be more fully engaged in the world, not retreat from us, from it, in our own version of some separatist, survivalist sect from an Idaho of the psyche. That was fun. That was really just, that was fun. <laughs> I'll do it again. See, we must find a way to be more fully engaged in the world and not retreat from it in our own version of some separatist survivalist sect from an Idaho of the psyche. We need to find a way to swim in the public pool without devaluing or losing touch with what makes us unique. And we can trust that the public pool will present us with enormously challenging and complex reactions to whatever the future has in store for us. 
So now this last little section was actually the most difficult for me to do because I found myself saying, what would I like to happen? Or what do I think needs to happen? I found myself using the C word, which I really, I've avoided for I don't know, 40 years of being a union, the consciousness word. I don't like the consciousness word because I think it's overused and it sort of means everything and nothing. So I don't use it. I found myself in this paper writing about the need for a evolution of global consciousness. I was embarrassed, but it's the truth. It's simply the truth. We need an evolution in global consciousness and it's very complicated because one thing we've learned as Jungians is that if you don't pay close attention to what's unique about an individual, unique about the place that the individual lives in, unique about the culture of the individual, you've missed the whole deal. You can't go straight to the archetype. You can't go straight to the universal. You can't go straight to the global. It won't work. It's a bust. And it's boring. Actually, it's boring. So unless what we propose for a change in global consciousness has, is not rooted in the particularities of individual and place and culture, we're kidding ourselves. There is no sudden pill we're going to take to bring along global consciousness. Now I imagined, can I have the next slide please? Houston? There you go. So when I was thinking about this, and it's really interesting because Craig, uh, separately working in Australia, has come up with a pretty similar thing, working from very different perspectives. But when I thought about what kind, what do I even mean by a change in global consciousness that takes into account and is rooted in the particular? Um, I thought about the Eleusinian Mysteries, which actually functioned for about 2,000 years in, and were the central religious experience of the Western world. And in some ways, we don't know what the mysteries were about. about. That's why we have this mystery here right in front of you. And if anybody can figure out the equation for how to survive in the future, they will get the door prize, which is the mystery. That's just, to, just to, that's just to keep you awake. <laughs> so, anyway, the, the idea is that people went to the Ellipsis and they came out different. And the people who came out different included Plato and Aristotle and Sophocles and Plutarch. And just about every important name that's lived through history, they all went to Ellipsis and they all had an experience all of whom, all of which they testified to, transformed their life. There was some transformative spiritual experience that changed their relationship to themselves and the community. Now the problem in our world is there are a lot of people having these experiences, these kind of rebirth experiences. Fortunately, most of them belong on the fundamentalist end of the spectrum. If you ask where rebirth is happening more in a spiritual sense. Just look at Christian fundamentalists, look at Jewish fundamentalists, look at Muslim fundamentalists. Those are the people that are getting transformed. I think they're getting transformed in the particular, a particular place, a particular culture, set of cultural problems, and then they're mistaking the particular for the universal. It's a terrible mistake and we're all suffering from it. I think we need some kind of global mystery uh, religion awakening. And the reason I think it has to be in that form because it, it needs the energy of the self, of the psyche behind it. It will not happen unless there's tremendous collective energy. It won't make a difference unless it's, unless it's hugely collective. Now, that doesn't mean it all has to be the same all the world around. It can be very particular but it has to have at its foundation a universal sort of global perspective. And that's actually very, very difficult. It requires some sort of transformative awakening 
Um, and we need to sort of steal the thunder from those people right now who are specializing in transformative awakenings, which mostly are on the fundamentalist side of the religious spectrum. Um, let's see the next image, please. Oh, I chose this image from the Red Book because it demonstrated exactly what I was thinking about. It wasn't Jung's intention. I don't think. I don't know what Jung's intention was for this. But what it has for me is if you look at the bottom part of that image, it's pretty local. It's in a very specific place. It's got a very specific climate. It's got very well, specific structures and buildings. It's clearly a Western European place. Back. Then above that is this huge bursting. Everybody's had that? Maybe you've seen enough of it. <laughs> well, I like this because to me it combines the particular and the universal, and that's the point I was making about the so, <laughs> thank you. I could. Yeah. <laughs> I think I said it really. I love. I love it because it's got the particular and the universal. And if we're talking about any kind of awakening of global consciousness, it really has to have both. It has to have both. And I think Jung, so I don't know if that was his intention in this drawing, but it's got both. Um, so the next image is just, that's just, uh, you know, how, how long ago did we first see that image? Was it almost 50 years ago? Or when did we first see the Earth from? 63 or something. So that's that's what? That's a fifth that image is fifty this is sixty years ago. Now this is actually a new NASA photograph. But did he? Is that right? Well he saw a lot of things before other people. Before the Earth is a whole from space. So that's interesting because I chose that. I chose. I, ch I just said anything but the North American continent, because you can choose either the North American continent point of view, or and I thought we better go somewhere else. Uh huh. It is there, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So now I just want to finish with an image that is from. Can we shift here? This is from the new book that Craig and I and several others contributed to called Placing Psyche, Exploring Cultural Complexes in Australia. And I, I chose this as our last image for two reasons. I wanted to plug our book, but also because I think it too is an image of a very particular place, very specific place, very unique. At the same time, if you look at the image, it can it can almost turn into an anatomy of the psyche, if you will, because it's got this neuronal and muscular kind of interconnectedness. So that there's, in my mind, this image has something both of the absolutely particular, the absolutely universal of what it is to be human. <clears throat> so here's where I want to finish up. What I hope for seems hardly possible, but the failure to bring the opposites of the particular and universal together in some new global consciousness, the failure to do that will, in my opinion, result in what Cormac McCarthy testifies to so eloquently in his last sentences of The Road, which I believe speaks both to the soul of the individual, be it trout or human, and you'll see why I chose trout, and the soul of the world. Allow yourself to meditate on the placing psyche cover image with its vermiculate patterns that are maps of the world in its becoming. It's a mirror of these final words from Cormac McCarthy's The Road. 
Once there were brook, brook trout in the streams in the mountains. You could see them standing in the amber current where the white edges of their fins rumpled softly in the flow. They smelled of moss in your hand, polished and muscular and torsional. On their backs were vermiculate patterns that were maps of the world it's becoming, maps and mazes of a thing which could not be put back, not be made right again. In the deep glens where they lived, all things were older than man, and they hummed of mystery. But we're going to get started again when we say, let's go, let's go.
final também por isso aqui. Tom, are you there by chance? Tom, I'm just trying to make certain that our your audio is still up and running. Can you hear me? Billy, can you hear me? Billy, are you able to hear me at all? I'm hearing you over the phone, but not over the over the computer. Hmm. No, but I'm speaking and I'm not muted on the computer, and I don't even hear myself coming through. Well, okay, good enough. We're done. All right, we're good to go. Thanks, Billy. Tom, just so you know, I guess you guys are going to have to dial in again and unmute yourself. I don't know that he's heard you, Billy. Lynn, you're on as well. Um, Tom, are you all, I take it you all are dialing in since you're showing up there as the panelist right now. But I'm hearing no audio from him. Really. I put him up to organizer. Tom, you should be able to unmute yourself when you guys get on online on the phone. Billy, it says to me that he needs his audio PIN in order to be able to unmute himself. And that PIN number is 149. Can you chat that to him? I will to him, and Should I send it to Alexandra? Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Oh wait, here we go. Hello? Hi Tom. You can, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. You're in there. Okay, we're back online and Craig is going to start. Just one sec. Okay, great. All right, folks, here we go with the second part of the presentation. Thanks for, thanks for uh, sticking around and being patient with us.
Craig go back to Australia? Tom, do we? You're all set. Yeah, this is mine. Here's mine. Craig is now coming here. Craig is on the phone. Is that all right? Try. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, a little after 11. Do we need this right in front of us here? That's and just right. Yeah. I didn't. Just getting organized. Okay, I think we're nearly ready. Tom, are we? No, all, all set. Everybody set. The webinar set. We're good to go. You said, yep, yep. We can hear you fine, Craig. Thank you. Okay, you're ready to go. I have to say, Tom, it's a great pleasure to be back here in San Francisco. Uh, Twelve years ago, we were here. You promised me I could come back after we did the um, Sugar Man, the Dionysus event. And unfortunately, there were those uh, tragic events in New York 2001, which rather upset a lot of the travel plans that were existing then between America and Australia. And we've now had to wait to this tranquil time <laughs> <laughs> to return. So thank you very much. And I'm very pleased to be here. My, my, my part of the event is in at least two parts. It's a bit long. We'll have a break, which will allow you again to have a break, and then some more, and then the discussion session all being well. This, um, from my point of view, today, the 25th of February, is the birthday of a very dear friend who passed away last year. He's a native of this city, Robert Dreyfus who uh, I regret couldn't be here today, so my talk is dedicated to Robert Dreyfus. Mm -hmm. Also spent many years in Pakistan, and so I suppose we should also think of those in, in, in Syria at the moment and the loss of the life of the two journalists who have done a great deal to attend, to listen carefully and to report on spheres of conflict over these last few years. So to Marie and her French colleague. My focus is on the last sentence in the um, outline of this talk. Can analytical psychology play a healing role in tomorrow's world? 
or might analytical psychology in all its variations, as well as many other humanistic and spiritual traditions, be forced to sit helplessly on the sidelines as the future of humanity unfolds. I like that sentence, and so my talk is dedicated to responding to that sentence. I'm beginning with my own country, or with a view of it, by a photograph facing Spikey, a, 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 and the map of Australia. There you see Australia, and you see in the background the arid zone, and it is inhabited there by a rather large and vigorous mob of camels. The camels are not native to Australia. They brought Pakistan and Afghanistan some hundred years ago to help in the ex exploration and carrying goods up from Adelaide, up to um, other springs where I live now with my family, and further north. When the camels were superseded by the train and by the trucks, by, by the roads, uh, then the camels were either um, let go or were shot. But many of the Afghani Cameleers didn't want to have their camel shot, so they let them go. There were several thousand at that time. There are now one million camels in Central Australia, expanding rapidly. And it's expected there'll be two million in a few years, so that even though the native species are becoming extinct, the camel, I can assure you, will survive. <laughs> it's my wife's task, Jude Pritchard, whose photo I won't show you now, but later, her task to be pretty well coordinating the efforts to um, convince the camels to reproduce less and, if possible, become smaller and not worry us so much. So Australia, even the most arid area of it, most as it were undiscovered part, if there is a central area and this is the photograph and this is where I'm from and the nature of my talk be based or evolve from thank you camel. Next slide. The next slide uh, is should be a slide of the tribal boundaries. This is to give you an, an idea of the pre-existing and still existing original um, which we call the mosaic of the Aboriginal indigenous tribal groups of Australia. different languages spoken, a vast range of people, a great sense of humor, but also a country on the very brink of cultural devastation. So I will be speaking from there. My next image is that of, again, an, over, an overview, an aerial view for you, similar to the one on the cover. In fact, it may even be the same one of a river from the air by Jenny McFarland, an anthropologist who was also an excellent photographer. That gives you, if you like, a sense of the desert and the arid lands. And now we might pass to the next image, which will be a beginning for you of a map of the talk. This um, map is, of course, for those of you who are familiar, is derived from uh, the painting that will come soon from a central desert iconography, and I need to explain it to you. And I've definitely definitively followed um, my friend Andrew Spencer's iconography because it works so well. On the top, you will see three circles linked together, and that is a simplified description Andrew Spencer Jabaljari, a Walpuri tribal man, painting which you will see later. Beneath that are four horseshoe type figures. The horseshoe figure represents a person sitting down. This is in the Walpuri and Central Australian iconography. A human being is represented by the imprint that they leave sitting down on the sand or the earth. So there 
see you have three people sitting down. One is represents a Walpuri, that's a tribal group, Andrew Spencer's tribal group. The second is the Crow, that is to say um, from, from Native American Crow tribe, um, which I'll refer to. The fourth is a citizen, in fact, for example, ourselves. And the fourth represents a psychotherapist, an analytical psychologist sitting down, and they are all looking at this scenario, past, present, and future, which will be represented when you see it. Beneath that are the same four people, representing those four people, sitting together, looking at each other, talking to each other, and exchanging some issues that you'll come to later on. It's called the philosopher questions. Beneath that in the map, you see something I've marked as Cora. It's a kind of um, elliptical shape with things in the Cora, meaning the basket. And here, ladies and gentlemen, You, you probably didn't realize, and I'm sorry for those on the web who can't see this, we have a beautiful basket, very simple one here. It contains a jar of pomegranate juice with reference, of course, to the lady of the pomegranate. We have some grapes, which are in the reference to the gentleman of the grapes. No, not Tom Singer. But Dionysos. There are two pairs to represent certain significant parts of the nature, two mushrooms. Craig, I'm sorry to in, uh, Craig, I'm sorry to interrupt. This is Billy from the webinar. Can you um would you Yeah, hey, I'll get done. If you could so, stand a little bit closer to the speakerphone. We're we're having some trouble hearing you um from this side. No, that's because I moved away. Okay. Okay. So I was showing secret to the secret of the Eleusinian mysteries to the people here, but I'm not going to show them on the <laughs> webinar. <laughs> 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 but it's a basket of seeds in various references to the Persephone and Demeter fertility. It's very nice, and one here will win the prize. So I referred to the Quora, that's the basket which we'll come to in another stage in, in my talk. And then at the bottom, you see this um, kind of four-part grid. I've called it the institutional grid. It's a few other things. And I, I won't go ahead of that myself there, but even though my talk will seem a bit confusing to you, um, there are, in fact, four major parts, and we'll proceed through those. Is that sufficient, Tom? Is that clear enough? Yes, we have the mystery in the, oh yes, and we have a, the action figure of Carl Jung in the in the basket, plus a donkey, <laughs> plus a little dog. <laughs> so now I'd like to give you um, the people on the webinar and to those of you here, keeping that map up for the time being, a a just a summary of what I wish to address. With you what I'm going to do. I'm going to advocate Jungian analysts to cultivate, cultivate hybrid vigor, specifically in relation to the localized global issues, as distinct from introverted monocular insistence on clinical consulting room purities. clinical consulting room purity as being the only aim and the only institutionalized practice that a Jungian analyst can enter. So I'm advocating for the hybrid of analytical psychology in the contemporary world. I will also, and I am continually advocating for pure line analytical psychology paradoxically at the same time. And I will say later how I see that as being exemplified in quiet, internal, persistent cultivation of a particular state of mind. I've codenamed that myself the Tiresias mind. But of course, each of you will have your own codename for that very particular 
form of mindfulness upon which one draws as an analyst and a psychotherapist. That should never be discarded. Finally, I might get around to suggest that analytical psychology can be proudly, distinctly, explicitly aligned with the ethics and the teachings of the avatars, the incarnation of the preservation and protection of the universe. In whatever embodiment touches the fate of the person in their time and their place, such an alignment with the great teachings may guarantee analytical psychology's survival and competency, not as magical thinking, but as precise recognition of the traditions and the lineage of the great teachings. These teachings, perhaps, if properly utilized by us in a new form, without religious fundamentalism, may in fact allow analytical psychology to survive through the cultural devastation and also participate in cultural facilitation. These then are my main points I wish to bring to you. I need to say to you too, that just a little orientation, is that I'm born in Australia. I was brought up in very, rem very remote and rather desiccated parts of the country. I'm not therefore what you would call a city boy. Nevertheless, I have lived in Sydney and Melbourne and London. I have uh, went to London for my training and lived there for 19, 20 years with the SAP. I feel completely at home in the European cultural and in the British cultural system. And without that, we would not, let us say, without that, let us acknowledge, right, let's acknowledge the, the richness of the, of the European and the British tradition in analytical as well as in, in culture. And at the same time, I have also returned to Australia. I have worked for maybe 15 or 16 or more years, I forget exactly now, in those most remote and arid and non-European sections of the country. So I'm bringing, in a sense, my own hybridity to you. I'm speaking to you my appreciation of the urban civilization and my experience very raw experience in the remote and uh, um, arduous areas of, of the Australian um, indigenous world. I feel that gives me a, a balance in order to address these things because for those 15 years or so I have lived and worked on the edge of cultural education and similarly in the urban environment. Now let us turn to Jabal Jari Spencer's painting, which will be the schema from which I will operate. Which, uh, please look at that landscape, get the feeling of it, and then move to the painting. The next, next one. And there's the painting. This is a picture, as it were, from above. First of all, geographically depicting um, the country which the painter is familiar with. And I'd like to draw your attention first to the fact that this is not a Eurocentric view. The painting itself is called Thinking About the Future or Thinking About Young People. The future is seen from the point of view of an indigenous Australian. It reflects, reflects exactly the same issues which are brought by Chief Plentiku in Jonathan Lear's book, Radical Hope, which I draw to your attention, written by a psychoanalyst from Chicago, Radical Hope, and I refer to this. Radical Hope, Ethics in the Face of Cultural Devastation. You can see he is a companion to Andrew Spencer Jabaljari, the Walpuri point of view. Now I'll go to the form of the painting for you. Groups of people are sitting gathered across the country in each tribal region. All are depicted as sitting, thinking, worrying about the same problem. And you'll see there the group, the horseshoe figures sitting around a circle, 
um, represented rather like a target, which tends to represent a fire or a gathering space. So you get you have one, two, three, four, five, six, I think, those smaller circles which represent people sitting and considering the same problems from their own points of view in their different tribal or cultural areas. Now the main structure of this painting, which was done in fact in 1992-1993, um, I was present at the whole development of the painting and in fact have a joint sense of joint ownership of it, which is why I'm showing it to you. Um, Spencer Bulgari and myself were developing this painting when thinking about young people as part of our conjoint work with young petrol sippers, gasoline sippers, um, substance abuse, young indigenous men and women who were absorbed in gasoline sniffing. And this, this painting became his formulation, thinking about young people and the issues that they face. So what you have on the left is Andrew's Spencer's representation of the culture, the strength of the culture, his culture, Walpuri culture, held together in a firmly constructed way, one, two, three, four, five circles, and bound together in a very complex way, which um, is his were representation of an integrated cultural system, not a necessarily saying it's a beautiful uh, system, he's not saying, oh, you know, oh, this was so wonderful in the old days. What he's saying is this is the representation of a culture held together in integrity with its law intact. And from that matrix, connections and people and generations were formed. You will see lines which are very simple there, they're rep simple representations, but they represent the interconnections across the Australian continent between the tribal groups, between the groups of cultures, um, which are tend to be referred to as the long lines, dream, dreaming tracks, jukapa tracks, but it means more or less the way in which culture is embedded in the country, in the place, and also in, uh, the interactions occur throughout the country. This is a kind of neural map of the inter cultural interconnection, rather like um, we saw earlier with um, the creeks and rivers. Now his emphasis there is, in the center, you see there, there's a yellowish kind of one with more people sitting around. And this is the scene of devastation. This is the scene also represented by him as the present. The present situation. The present situation is that every, everything that was once understood in clear terms is now covered by a kind of dust. It's obscure. We're not quite sure what direction it is. And in the middle, you see that there are representations. I won't go into the detail, but there are representations of ill health, of people sitting in drunken states, young people sniffing petrol, parents um, neglecting their children. Um, child care, um, the ch child care educational process diminishing, loss of, of culture, loss of language, um, and you know you can follow that through. Um, an excessive amount of death, <coughs> the failure of a culture, in fact, to come to terms with the incursion of the white man. Uh, and here in that picture, you also have a people all sitting together trying to puzzle what to do about it. And the picture there representing many people meeting black and white um, has occurred many times. There have been hundreds and perhaps thousands of meetings in the last decade or so of government workers, police workers, tribal workers, all saying what on earth are we doing and how will we see our way through to the future. Across to the other side of the painting, the right is the representation of the future. In this, Andrew Spencer is saying, we know there will be a future. We hope and anticipate that the culture, the culture which has, with which we are familiar will exist in the future in some form, 
but he particularly left out the binding elements. You'll see there in that circle, that there's a central circle, that there are one, two, three, four, five circles surrounding it. it was introduced another one, I think, as a way of indicating the influence of, of um, European civilizations incorporation into the Aboriginal culture, the fifth element. But you'll notice that nothing binds it together. His point is, the elements may be there, but the binding might have gone. We do not know what will hold us. So I hope that reading conveys to you a very straightforward indication from a thoughtful man as he reflects upon the situation of his own people in his own time, in that case, 1993. Now, I have to remind you, of course, and those of you who are not familiar with this particular kind of part of the world, the Australian Aboriginal hunter-gatherer culture was organized in a particular form with specific ethics, procedures, hierarchies of knowledge, knowledge control, gender and social law, land management, healing methodologies, spiritual organization. The condensed form of the essentials, the core of the culture, have been depicted by Spencer and many other spokespersons as five interactive elements. They are place, or Nura, Nura, which means the original and primary place where you are located. Walcher, or kin, without your family systems you are isolate and, and, and kind of unknown. Kulanpa is the term used to indicate the vitality of your spirit, or perhaps what you might call psyche. Jukupa, which is the term used to refer to your cultural law, your kind of symbolic and, and, and the narrative of your, of your culture, and kanyinjaku, which is a wonderful term, which means the carrying of things. So if you really condensed indigenous Australian culture, which had had no contact with Western civilization, those five elements represent core elements of a culture, which I'm not going to elaborate more on, but it may interest you to know that how if you like, universal, these notions of the family system, direct relationship with country and place, the need to take care of the psyche, the vitality being essential, the vitality of the cultural law, and the fact that it has to be carried. It's the dropping of the carriage, of the basket, which is the crime. So I'll repeat, that the future is seen to exist, the form of the future and how a new culture will look is represented, but it is not clear what or how indigenous Australians, Americans, English, Chinese, French, Libyans, Syrians, what form their new tribal affinities will be, what locations will be, how they will bind together the elements needed to maintain a viable and civilized life. My suggestion to you that some people, next slide, that psychoanalysts, that thoughtful people have found a way to emphasize the necessity of binding together the elements of the mind and the psyche and the heart and the body in order to sustain a viable civilization, whether it's a, a singular civilization, internal civilization, the civilization of oneself, or whether it's the civilization of one's group, tribe, city, place, or country. This is to acknowledge that the psychoanalytic tradition, which includes all those people who fought and tried to kill each other, that they have a kind of carrying notion, which includes the recognition of early infants, the significance of the maternal child bond. This is a core contribution that this, group, this society can make to carrying forward civilization. Acknowledging also the richness, which here is the typical consulting room. But these consulting rooms are sometimes reviled as being isolated. But in fact, what often a consulting room is, is a repository of the um, of 
some of the woven fragments of a civilization. Those little funny objects those shrinks keep. You know? Sometimes they really are iconic um, maintainers of, of, of the civilization. So let's not, let's not do more than acknowledge that. Now, I want to take you now to, to three men who, who are, are the recipients of the 2011 Sigmund Freud World Congress Award for Contributions to Psychotherapy. As Sigmund Freud, City of Vienna's award to psychotherapists last year awarded in Sydney was to three indigenous traditional healers from South Australia. Your family. <laughs> there you have these three men. There were three men, three women, and then it was a group. For the first time, it was a conjoint award to a group, not to an individual psychotherapist. You know, Mr. Yalom and all those good guys. No, this is a group. And there was another woman and another uh, indigenous psychiatrist. But these are the three men I want to show you. Yes, I will tell you their names. Toby Ginger. This is his English name. Toby Ginger, Rupert Peter, who I regret was killed in a motor car accident two weeks ago. So I'm showing Andy Gillery. So you lose one man out of a group like that. But this is not to lament Rupert Peter, it's to acknowledge. Now, these are referred to as Nunkery. The Nunkery lineage and the line of thought emphasizes that physical and mental illness and disorder is eternal in human nature. Therefore, so too is eternal the therapeutic effort. One day, you know, maybe, Tom, you'll get everybody, you know, healthy forever, but I doubt it. So it does look as though therapists of some kind are likely to be with us for a very long time. The issue is what form the therapist practice. Hungary have a lineage, they have skills, they have a way of teaching, they collaborate closely now with Western workers, and they, th these three men collaborate closely with the mental, the mental health team of which I'm a part. I would say that these men now are truly becoming hybrid healers because they're integrating with the Western methodology and with the, uh, the contemporary situations of the Australian world, which is not what it was 100 or 200 years ago. But it is encouraging to see traditional healers who, whose culture itself is, is under disintegration but nevertheless advocating themselves the hybrid conjunction of the Western and the traditional forms. Now I want to take you to a slightly different view. The next image, please. There is a painting by a friend and colleague of mine, Rod Moss. The painting appears in um, Place It shows you a an experience, let's say, of, of um, the Western doctor, there's a, a, it's Dr. Uh, Goldenberg, who is a um, remote area physician, Jewish man, beautiful man, um, but he's agreed to model Freud, and he's on the couch there, and you can see that that's Freud's consulting room transposed, Central Australia, and that the objects around are not Freud's um, objects from um, Egypt or wherever, but actual kind of you know local objects. And the analyst is a man called Patrick Hayes. Patrick Hayes agreed to model this too with with um, Rod. He was delighted to be put in the place of the doctor rather than of the patient. <laughs> and he's listening, as it were, to Freud's dream, and no doubt having a very interesting reconfiguration and of how he will interpret. Yeah. But this is this is a this is a way of representing the reversals that are occurring. None of us can assume our assumed place. 
I love this painting, and most of the psychiatrists and the remote mental health um, team with whom I work have it as their screensaver currently. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I suppose I'll say this is a little bit of a brief moment. So as I lie here on that couch with old Patrick Hayes, attentive ear and eye, I wonder in a kind of reverie, in what form will we today envisage the strong line of therapy into the future? How is our practice reforming itself under current conditions to meet the illnesses of the present and of the future? Do we feel a tension in ourselves to conserve and protect a defensive anxiety to keep things as they are? Or can we go with Heraclitus and say, whoever cannot seek the unforeseen sees nothing, or the known way is an impasse? Whoever cannot seek the unforeseen sees nothing, or the known way is an impasse, Heraclitus. And let me say that if you were there with a six by eight foot canvas, like Andrew Spencer's canvas, how would you represent the state of your therapia, your therapeutic culture? How would you represent the situation of yourself, your patients, your tasks, your conditions now? What imagery would you use to depict a past, a present, and a future which itself is sliding? How would you represent the lineage of your own therapeutic culture? Upon whom do you or I rely internally? Who for us embodies the essentials of that lineage? Rupert says, my grandfather taught me, and he holds the, the map and power, the power of the therapeutic capacity. So I would say, who holds the map and power for you, for me? And how would you distill essential coordinates of a culture which you hold as being essential? Could you distill it to four elements bound together? Now I want to go to the image of radical hope, the next. That's just to restate for you the elements in the Japaljari painting. Now let us go to the next, please. This is the cover of the book, which I regret we have no time to really engage in, but I want to outline it to you, radical hope. It was such a pleasure for me to find a psychoanalyst who was also a philosopher considering these issues. He considered it by direct reference to the narrative of a Crow Native American around the 1880s when he, the man whose name gets translated as plenty coup, which means plenty scalps, that is to say also a man of many achievements, that is to say in terms of his culture, he, he cut a lot of scalps, therefore he conquered a lot, Therefore, he was a pretty serious warrior. Therefore, he was respected. Therefore, he's called a man of many achievements. And Plenty, Plenty Coup, who was a friend, well, not friend, but a colleague, let's say, of Sitting Bull, my country, it's your country, but I'm referring to what Jonathan Lear says, that the issue was that Sitting Bull and Plenty Coup, the Crow and the Sioux, were trying to figure out what to do about the Americans. And more or less, Sitting Bull and his mates agreed to fight against the Americans. And you remember that there was some significant battle with Custer and, and Little Big Horn and so on. And better or for worse, the Sioux were not able to prevail eventually over the United States cavalry. This is a very significant uh, familiar scene in Australia. Whereas Plenty Coup said, said, we must approach this matter differently. He did this because he remembered a dream he'd had when he was 10 years old, 9 and 10. In the book, the dream is recounted in detail. 
and Jonathan Lear expounds on it with Teddy Coo's interpretation. But the fundamental notion is that ten, this young man, seen a vision of the buffalo upon which his crow, which the crow and the Sioux, I believe, um, main, whole culture was main, um, depended upon the existence of the buffalo. And in the dream, he sees the buffalo gone and replaced by cattle. He realizes, as a boy, that the, that the buffalo are gone. And then there's more in that dream, much more. But um, it will it will be a, del a delight to to consider in a seminar among unions to really get the grip of it. But later, as a man, he brings that dream in its complexity to the meeting with Sitting Bull and and the Sioux and the other Crow senior men and, and there were the women there and understand how the Crow system works. And he used that dream to say, "We will never defeat the cattle." The cattle will increase and the buffalo will decrease. Therefore, the way in which our culture is sustained by the relationship with the buffalo, that which sustains it will go. Either we go with the buffalo or we find a way to adapt to these new circumstances. If we fight, we can see there are more soldiers than we can ever engage in, but fighting is our cultural way. So why not go down in a blaze of glory at least? Then he pulls back from that and says, that form of fighting and, sh and the display of our courage will, will not bring us to the, uh, to, to the continuation of our culture. There has to be a different future, which I, Plenty Coup, cannot imagine. But let us make a choice not to go the way of the Sioux, but to find if it's possible to make an accommodation with the Americans. Then the rest of the book and the rest of the 20 to 30 years is the description of the accommodation that was made, for better or worse, with the American rather than the fight with the American. Now, it's a fascinating story and full of tragedy and hidden interest. But this book is called Radical Hope. Because what Jonathan Lear brings out from it is this notion which I think appeals to us all, must appeal, is there will be a future, as Andrew Spencer recognizes. And we still have to maintain hope, because without hope, we are hopeless. But how can we maintain hope when we have no idea what the future will be? So, Hope, which is based on fantasy, is of absolutely no, no, no use to us. But hope, which is based on the possibility that we can imagine and construct a future, that is something. That is something. And in reading Radical Hope and in reading The Road, which Tom has brought to us, you see, I think, a similar situation. Those of you who have read it, those of you, you see a father maintaining love for his son, and refusing on several occasions to commit suicide together, even though their situation is utterly hopeless. And there are these brief, succinct conversations. Shall we continue or shall we die now? They continue. Somehow you get the sense that even though you know, the reader knows, that probably the whole thing will end in hopelessness. The road is pretty bad. America is locked out. Yet they maintain a kind of hope and it's maintained in the relationship between the father and the son and the memory of the mother. This is very poignant. It sustains them. In the end, as you know, the man, the father, dies. He can't go on any longer. He dies in lung condition. But the boy continues. Who knows? You know, let's not get you know, over-sentimental about it. But it's a similar notion of how to maintain hope in the most hopeless circumstances. And what I like particularly about Plenty Coup and about Lear's effort is that they re bring that back to psychic and intellectual hope. Not only about you know, will we survive the economic problem, but how does a human being cultivate psychologically the kind of hope that's required, the radical hope, the hope that returns you to the roots of yourself and your country in order that you might survive. More could be said about that. 
but that will do us for the moment. We go to the next picture. So here's Spencer's effort. Radical hope. When I see my friends dying, when I see this, when I see that, can I have hope? Well, one form is that for him to, re to, to reiterate what are the core conditions of his uh, ethic, which are I must maintain my family, I must maintain my jukapa, my cultural law, I must, ma must ensure that, my, uh, that, that the, the relationship with my, with my place continues, and I must take care of my own spirit, my own, my own sort of vitality. At least I can do that. He represents that in his writing. Could we now go to the next, please? This is a return to the map. You see that I have on the map attempted to link, bring you now down to slightly represent for you a wall preview of the situation of radical, radical hope or cultural devastation as viewed from Andrew Spencer's point of view, as indicated only briefly from a Crow point of view, to give you the opportunity to sit in the citizen's position and consider the past, present, future and your cultural you know, condition. And then as a therapist to be sitting there and thinking about, well, what is my cultural, my therapeutic cultural lineage and how do I assist people of diverse cultures who themselves are caught in those circumstances? So that's okay for you there. Now we'll pass to the next piece. What I try to do there is put it into a slightly different form to give you the notion of cultural, cultural um, variation. So you can see there, you know, the, the indigenous Australian, the indigenous American, the citizen, and the um, analytical consultant consultations kind of story the time as we consider our cultural cora. The cora, I remind you, is a, a, a term which comes from Timaeus, from Plato. It's an older Greek concept. The notion of it is, and there are different spellings, but I prefer the K. The notion is there is a basket in space and time, a preliminary, existent, and primordial, primordial basket which contains and holds the universe without which, without those original conditions, nothing would have been created. Timaeus goes into, into the dialogue and says, you can talk about who made, who made the world, how the world is formed, etc., etc., but first consider the primary conditions, the basket, out of which all things came. And you, we've taken that a little bit differently and said, there's a cultural basket too. Not, that the basket is the sense, core is the sense, how, how do you represent that which is essential, the essential space from which a culture or, or a practice or whatever develops. So this is the cora. It's represented in, on the left in, in uh, Spencer's painting. There are the current existential conditions, and we are in an existential condition, and he is in an existential and so is in it. We all have these existential conditions. Sometimes they're devastating and sometimes they're happy. Then there's the question about the minding of the Quora. How do you mind it? Then there's the notion of the dream, the seer. Somehow, perhaps, some people who have the capacity, the insight, to be able to see a lot further into the matrix of the Quora, of that which sustains us, and into the matrix of what is essential for human life. And my suggestion is that the that analytical psychology is part of the lineage of the seers who are able to dream the future and also know or much more adept at recognizing the matrix, the structure of, of human, the human core or human civilization and have something to contribute. And finally is this notion about you know, the future and the danger which Tom has pointed out, projecting futures, the pessimistic or the optimistic projection. And I think psychoanalysts, psychotherapists, we can be very attentive to the way in which projections create the future for better or for worse. Now I'd like to go um, to the next one, just to give you a reference of here. This is a kind of the clash of ideas. This is, um, 
Journal of Foreign Affairs. It's a well-respected journal. I got it in the airport, of course, on the way over. The title is The Clash of Ideas, Ideological Battles That Made the Modern World and Will Shape the Future. So here you see in, in Foreign Affairs, same preoccupation. How did we get to where we are today, economically, democratically, politically? I recommend it to you. How did we get to it? And what they've done is they've, um, they've collected extracts from foreign affairs journals from about 1922. And you see representative journals, uh, sorry, articles, 1922 through the Depression, coming up to the, to the, um, the rise of Nazism, comments on Nazism, comments on communism, an article on Lenin, one on Trotsky, one, on, one or two on the war, one on the rehabilitation after the war, and coming right through up to the present time. If you want to get a quick scan of, of what happened down in Europe and America since 23, the clash of ideas and the ideology, not so much about you know psychological ideologies, but economic ideologies. That's not our speciality, but if we remain uh, oblivious of the, of the economic realities, we are you know, due to downfall as well. Can I go to the next, please? Next slide. Thank you very much. And here's my lovely quote from Heraclitus. Now we're going to have a little rest, Tom. Because I'm a long way from home, um, this is a little reverie. I'm showing you photographs mostly, typical family photographs from my own home, um, kids next door, and it's all around this, and there's maybe 10 of these, we'll let them slowly fade through. The, you know, these are white Anglo-Saxon kids um, thinking about taking care of ducks, playing in the sand, there's a Winnicott thing, you know, on the seashore of endless worlds, children play, a reference to. My granddaughter's there in blue and a friend. Keep going. This is a rest. Now, you used to have a little rest. This is another seashore of an endless world, the Mediterranean, Israel, Lebanon, Syria, Cyprus, Turkey, Egypt, another seashore where people played for centuries, thousands of years, millennia. This is a dark storm coming down over the sea near where I live, in when I live in Sydney. I put this in for Tom for the road. The dark storm approaches. We all have our image of the dark storm. And now here's Elsie. Elsie uh, plays in a band. She's 16. She's my um, daughter's friend. She's dressed up there deliberately because they decided when they knew I was coming to America to talk about the future that they'd send you their wishes for the future. So there's Elsie. I wish for world peace. Please tell the Americans that, she said. Next. This uh, is an Indian girl. That <laughs> My mother works in the hospital as a doctor. I wish for endless amounts of chocolate. <laughs> There's another one of my daughter's friends. I wish I had more money. Next. One of the local lads who fancies himself as an American. He's also wishing for world peace. Oh, yo. <laughs> Next. This is my daughter, 12-year-old. I wish my watermelons would grow. And this is another member of the family who says, I wish that good things happen more often and more slowly. And that's another one of them flying in a flight simulator machine flying into the future, who knows what kind of future. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let's have a break. Uh, and
invite you to look at Now you Ellicinian mysteries are revealed to you. <laughs> uh, okay, now we do. Um, Dan and Billy uh, will take a five or ten minute break. Okay, that sounds good. We're, we're going to mute you, so if, uh, if we're late to the game, just give us a chat and let us know that you're back on if that's okay. Is it coming through okay? Yeah, everything sounds good. Craig's a little broken up. I think that's just from him moving around, but, you know, relatively speaking, it's, it's going really well. Okay, I'll try and stay still. Thanks, Craig. Thank you. I appreciate it. Sorry, mate. Sorry. No, no, you're fine. This is going, this is wonderful, and you guys are giving a great presentation, so it's fascinating. Appreciate the chance to, to hear it. So we'll, uh, we'll reconvene in a few minutes. Should, um, should know your name. Peter Dunlop. Peter Dunlop? U-N-L-A. Ah, right. <laughs> Lynn? Yes, Billy? Yes, Billy? Oh, nothing. I was just checking in with you. I didn't know if you had anything else to say to Tom and Craig, or if we were just good to break for a few minutes. No, no, we're good. Okay. I'll, uh, we'll be back in in shortly, folks. I'll mute too. Thanks. Okay.
Yeah. Is that somebody? I go to one. Yeah. Is that alright? It's alright with me. Okay. You guys, you, okay. Are you guys coming back soon? Or are you ready to come back? Hey, Tom. We'll get we'll get back. Um, we've just figured out a way for the uh, discussion part after Prentice's presentation. We're going to speaker phone on a little table. We're going to have chairs, three chairs, my and Craig, and then anybody from the audience who wants to make a comment or come up so that directly into the phone. Okay. That sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. I guess all of the folks that are tuned in with us right now, uh, unless you're all still on break, uh, did hear what they just said. So hopefully, you might give us a a chance to actually post some questions. So we'll kind of deal with that as it comes up but utilize that question board or the chat board and Len will more than likely um, actually you know, pose the questions to Tom and Craig for you. So we'll continue momentarily. Len? Hey Billy. Hey, does that does that sound good to you? If we've got some yes, I, okay. I heard that. And I'm okay. Just, it does, and in fact, I'm going to send all the attendees a note inviting them to submit questions, and we'll see. I'm I'm not sure we'll get them asked, but at least we'll have some questions in the queue in case it, it turns to us. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Cool. Great. Tom, and we're going to finish at, uh, at one San Francisco time, uh, and then do the discussion. Is that okay, Tom? And if I finish before then, that's fine. So settle down. Uh, can I just check with the webinar if you're on and we're on? 
Yes, sir, we are on. We're ready to go. Anyway, you're ready to go. Okay, so you hear that. We'll do another 40, 40 minutes, um, maximum 40 minutes, then a break, and then discussion. Okay, great. We're, uh, yeah, we're anxious. So we're, we're here and ready. Okay, so you should now have in front of you the map again. Um, we've already moved down to um, the, through those four positions. And I want to make a comment, uh, an orienting comment, please, on this notion of past, present, and future. From the Walpuri point of view, let's say from one culture's point of view, their past is very present and living in it and with it. And their view of the future and their view of the present is from a Walpuri perspective, let us say in 2012. From the position of the man Plenty Coup and Sitting Bull and so on referred to in, in Lear, the past there for them is perhaps more than a hundred years ago. That same event, Spencer of Faces, occurred a hundred and more years ago for the, for the Crow. The future for the indigenous American man referred to there is a different future now than, had he, than the future he would have envisaged in 1880, 1890. So I'm wanting to introduce to you this notion that what is past and what is present and what is future for one person or one family or one tribal group or one institution is different past and a different future. So I think there's a saying, one man's past is another man's future. One man's future is another man's past. And we have to get this notion of the sliding scale of time because although it's true you could say that all people and all beings on Earth living in this current time, which is maybe cataclysmic, maybe not, from the perspective of the different countries and the different cultures, time past, time present and time future varies. Why am I saying this? Because I think from a psychological point of view this is crucial. As an analytical psychologist, it's to recognize that you may have a range of patients, clients, or people with whom you deal in hospital or elsewhere. whose location in time will not always be the same as one's own. His location in cultural time will not always be the same as one's own assumptions. And I'm mentioning this again so that we're attentive to the way in which psychological, psychoanalytic, I think, attentiveness is um, very deeply attuned to the movement of time, to variations in time. You know, collective unconscious and all that stuff is actually about recognition of the moving nature of time in relation to psychic reality. Is that Tom? <coughs> Tom's really keen on this and he, I hope I've got the first one. Now I'd like to take you to the four people sitting in the circle. Walpree the crow, the philosopher. Kant, the philosopher Kant and an analytical psychotherapist who could be any one of us here. Now here's a little story. This is a sort of reverie. Some philosophers sat on the road in a circle around a fire to which some felt like throwing all their books. Turning to Kant, I said, Dear Emmanuel, it's you for the fire next time. Wait a minute, said Emmanuel Kant. I have three questions yet to ask. Then you can send my books into the fire when you have answered them adequately. Is it a deal? It's a deal, I said. So Kant's questions were, these are true questions, which appear on page 103 of Lear's book, Radical Hope. Kant's questions were, the human being in the midst of the human condition, or what may I hope? 
and two, as a human being in the midst of the human condition, what can I know? Number three, as a human being in the midst of the human condition, what ought I to do? At which point Kant said to me, have you answered those questions yet? And I said, it might take me some time. <laughs> so following Kant, who asks questions, for what may I hope, what can I know, what ought I do, I also introduce for you a few more questions and some others. I'm thinking of the, con of the, of the Walpuri man contemplating his painting. He might say, how do I manage incursion into my country? How do I manage the progressive disintegration of my way of life? How do I maintain the core cultural values, law, law, jukapa, and pass these on in a system which will be understood by the younger people? How do I maintain the core cultural values of my law, law, and and pass these on in a way that will be understood by the younger generation? Or is this indeed no country for old men? Then. Sitting in that circle, there are two slightly dissociated analytical psychologists, Singer and San Rock. These are their questions on the road by the fire. How do I prepare my mind to survive and manage these conditions of the road? You realize I'm referring to the novel, The Road, where it seems that everything is free will gone except a small boy. How do I engage with the range of patients or client groups who themselves are faced with the road, themselves may be faced with the deintegration of Cora and the shattering of the books? What ought I to do? And the third question we say is, what may we hope from our training institutions? What can we expect from the institutional grid, the Moses law of psychotherapy and analytical psychology? How do we incorporate the facts of cultural life and breakdown and prepare the minds of future analytical psychologists and ourselves to handle whatever the contingencies are of a future which we cannot see? All of us, perhaps, on the road, like Plenty Koo and Japuljari, the point is, what may I hope from my training institution? And then as I sit there with Tom and with others, I'm thinking, but of course, I am myself obscured by all these matters. I too am caught in what is, we, we refer to as a cultural complex. When you're once caught in a cultural complex, is it? is as though often one is called in a medusa gaze, a kind of paralysis, because you know something's happening, but you don't know what it is. In fact, placing Psyche with the 12 authors, you will, when you come to read it, you will see that none of us are able to say very much. Mostly what we describe is the sense of uncertainty and the way in which our, we slowly come to terms with recognizing what the cultural complexes are which have us in Australia in grip. It's so easy for us to look at America or England and point to you and say, this is what's wrong with you. This is what has you in thrall. But it's so hard to do this for oneself and one's own nation. So I ask myself, am I caught in a cultural complex which dulls my perception, disorganizes my thinking, my long-term memory goes, and it protects all my illusions as though I were in a Medusa paralysis? The next question is, how might I depict, as in a glass, clearly this situation in which I find myself? And the third question is, how might I dissolve the inhibitions? 
how might I dissolve the, par the paralysis in which I am put as a member of the Australian nation? Now we might go and see if Heraclitus has got something to add again. Yes, that's not bad. Let us proceed. Kant and Lear, Singer and Sandrock, Plenty Coup and Pujari, and all the citizens seeking their questions to ask. If you're as clever as Kant, you can reduce them to three, and that'll keep you busy for a very long time. Let us proceed. Now I want to return to this notion of the Quora, the cultural Quora. And the illustration there is from an old friend of some of you, perhaps Joseph Anderson, it's a scribble of his, um, which, we, which we were using, we were working on the placing psych, psyche book. It is the notion of the repetition in culture and in time of, as it were, the repetition of the core issues of a culture, which I'm also calling the Quora of a culture but also the way in which a cultural complex or some circumstance unwinds, goes down, sinks and returns. Now, I love this drawing, and I'm going to leave it up there for a while. You can just use that for a bit of delivery and be spared any more maps for a while. Repetition in time and history of circumstances. In Plato's Timaeus is a debate on the nature of creation, its beginnings, its sustainment, and its end. And a character, Timaeus, declares that the debate about the processes and the futures of creation cannot begin unless we acknowledge the beginning, the original container which must have existed before any creation of the universe would have emanated. He speaks simply and eloquently of this original base from which things emerge as Korah. And the image is used of the basket the winnowing basket which holds seeds, seeds which multiply and contain foods and sustain life. The basket then is the image of the holder of the original seed burst, an original condition. If we speak of a cultural core, then let us speak of core ra. Consider the consequences if the place, the space, the container of a culture is wrecked, physically or mentally. And you may ask, where is the core located? How is the Quora established, defined, held, and kept alive in any cultural grouping? This you might contemplate. Remembering that the original image, the metaphor, is a basket which contains seeds and food, not some abstract mathematical pattern, but a basket containing seeds. And within that basket occur transformations, mysteries of Eleusis, it would seem that the initiate in the, initiate in the mysteries of Eleusis would, was presented at the bottom of a dark well or a dark pit, in the dark, with a winnowing basket, let down and laid out with objects which he or she could feel only in the dark, in the dark with darkened ore. Fruit, round and fertile, seeds sheathed and open to the touch, pomegranate, phallic object laid secretly, provocatively, a cloth, an emblem of the hidden. Who knows exactly, since this was a secret, but the feel of the fruits and the natural regenerations inherent in the seed of life, personified by Persephone and Demeter, perhaps this touched something at the bottom of the pit and revived their faith and their radical hope. So here, in the painting, of, not there, in the painting of Andrew Spencer, you have a representation of that original Cora. And so, too, you have in this painting here, this drawing, a representation of the repetition of the appearance and the disappearance of the core of a culture of the Cora. These are things that are worth considering. The Cora, then, is the basket or the carried container, which I consider it's worth us meditating upon in a simple way, which holds a few essential things, whether it is, in fact, grapes or pomegranates or bread or asparagus or rosemary or oil 
or pears or mushrooms, but the issue is a few things which are essential to your psychic and physical relation with life. Tamea says, nothing would have come into being if the basket hadn't have been there. There is a nest at the beginning of time in which is laid an egg and from which we, stars, suns and impulses have been born. No culture can carry on without its nest. Who carries the responsibility for the basket? Now after that I have a series of small questions. I think I will mention them because they came out of the conversations on civilization which you see referred to in, my, in the book, in my chapter called The Lemon Tree. In, in that, following Tom's notion of the particular, I set my chapter as a conversation primarily about difficulties in our Central Australian environment. But I set it in the form of a conversation with a man, Paul Kutlevin, who works in mental health, who works in Aboriginal health, who's very familiar with the circumstances of the people. And as the conversation unfolded, we began to get more of an understanding of how cultural complexes parallel. Now, what I'd like to do is read to you a few of the questions which emerge from that conversation, not in their exact original form, and not the questions that are in the book. It's sort of a riff off to the side. I have time. So, this question to me was this, framed like this. Well then, Craig, you talk about these things, but what are your personal identifications with civilization? What is civilization for you? Not the grand schema of the Romans and the Greeks and God knows what. What is your personal, uh, personal individualized identification with civilization? And with what form of civilization do you identify? How is this identification an extraction? How do you identify and extract the, the essential elements of your own work? Will these essential elements last forever, or will you have to fight to preserve them? And with whom will you fight? Craig, how would you configure the core or the root of your civilization? How might you express this core ethic, the radical factors radical meaning the root, the root factors, how will you express this and crystallize it? Will this radical root ethic, the core factor of my civilization, survive into a future? How can I guard its continuity? At what point will I know that I will cave in by the side of the road and let it all fade away? Oh, and by the way, said Paul at one stage. You figure yourself as a Jungian analyst, but what role did your analytic training and your experience in analysis have in forming any capacity that you have to live in the present circumstances here in Central Australia? Fine for the cities, but what about here? How, said Paul, did your analytic training form you and allow you to operate in circumstances such as this? I said to him something like this, my analytic training and my experience of 10 years of analysis, three with a Kleinian in London and seven with a, with a Jungian analyst and a few others scattered about here in their interactions, what I said was something like this, analytic training sent me like a canary down the mine. It showed truthful facts of human nature and prepared me for the worst and the best of times. I could go on now to give you examples of people who I know in Australia, valued colleagues, who I think, who I know have gone down the mine, are canaries of the time, who in their engagement with analytical practice and with various hybrid forms, I think exemplify the way analytical psychology in my country can and should develop. But since we're on a webinar and some of them might even be there, I don't want to mention their names. But let's just say, let us consider 
those people in your own training institution or among your colleagues who are probably hybrid, who are probably a bit mongrel, who are probably a bit on the edge, but who nevertheless, in their advocacy for a particular kind of development, may in fact be carrying the seeds of the next evolution of analytical psychology. Of course, it might be oneself. But let us think, let us acknowledge the mongrels among us. We have a term in Australia, mongrel. It means a hybrid, but it also means an irritating person or an irritating dog. <laughs> Among the irritants might well be the seed of the future. Now I'd like to pass on a little bit further to, to the question of zones. Yes. Now in our conversation about time, Tom and I tried to specify this thing that 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 the time and space varies and that you could be, as it were, one person can be in the zone of the past next to another who feels himself to be in the zone of the future, or the present. So if I'm thinking, sitting next to Andrew Spencer, the Walpere man, he considers himself to be in a particular time zone which includes his Walpere past, but I know I have no experience of the Walpere past. I have only the experience of my European Australian past. So we have two time zones simultaneously, as it were, the Walpere past and present, the European past and present, but two men are sitting together. And it, it, it sort of brings up this notion of the zonal confusions that can occur between people from different cultures. Zonal confusions is a, uh, an important psychoanalytic concept. So to simplify it, I, we also have zones of place. Here's another little riff. Once upon a time in 1968, I passed through Checkpoint Charlie in Berlin. Remember that sign? You are now leaving the American zone. Strange experience. There are zones of security, safety. There are zones of contact between people of different cultures or zones. There are zones of devastation and zones of restoration. And probably so many of us pass through different zones each day in a mental sense or a relational sense, from, do from zones of security to zones of contact to zones of devastation to zones of restoration. And some of us live in zones of security and are able to preserve them. Some live in zones of devastation. There are places, as you know, in the world right now. Iraq today, particularly, I would say, in the city of Homs, would be a zone of devastation. Syria. I apologize. Now, for many of us, the security and safety is essential. And in our profession, we provide a zone of security and a zone of contact for those who may, from time to time, inhabit psychically zones of devastation, zones of confusion, zones of trauma, zones of uncertainty, and our zone of security, mentally and physically, is essential, one would say, to assist in the restoration, or at least the holding of the core of the other person. The psychoanalysts, the analytical psychologists, the therapists, do provide, and we are experienced at providing zones of restoration, and we keep these zones in our heart, in our room, in our body our capacity, our trained psyche, do we not? This is a quality of civilization, a refinement of civilization, which analytical psychology and psychoanalysis has developed. The zone of maintaining security, the psychic devastation and psychic need of others who need a zone of transformation. Would that not be so? Some wrestle with these things in, in the so-called physical reality, in Syria, in the streets, in Central Australia, wherever it might be, these zones exist as real past the wall. In 1968, we crossed through Checkpoint Charlie, and there was a different zone. I would say that these are things we know about. They are valuable. They are somewhat secret and hidden. They are, to some extent, a mystery to many people. 
how we preserve and protect zones of security for ourselves and for other people for some times of the day. How we maintain a contact between strange persons, strangers and strangers, or for others, for some periods of the day. How we attend to devastation for some periods of the day in zones of devastation, and how we manage restoration for some periods of the day, humbly, modestly, not with omnipotent fantasy. I think the preservation of the zones is an attribute and a quality of the lineage of analytical psychology and psychoanalysis, which is worth preserving, which is worth drawing upon, and can be shared. Now I'd like to go to the psychotherapist's prayer number 34. Now we can go to the plan again. Now I want to draw our attention now to go down. We pass through the Quora, more or less, or acknowledged it. I want to go to this at the bottom. This is really coming close to chewing. to our completion. What I've been talking with you there, or trying to elaborate, and with Tom's help, is this notion of what analytical psychology actually does have, in its, as it were, uh, under the veil, in the basket, the elements. And this is something to be proud of, but also something to develop and make use of in various ways, as I'm sure many of us do, in relation to the cultural circumstances, the cultural devastation, if you like. And there are people who I know who have done that. And in my own practice in, in the remote areas, I try to develop these qualities, but not within the consulting room. I have no consulting room. I only have a, um, a motor car or a truck to offer and a ground to sit on, and people who will come and go. And there are no boundaries. So I have to find, I've had to find a way to internalize in the remote areas and the different areas the, 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 the core values of an analytical approach, but without the accoutrements. So into the future, I think there are four things that we should be carrying. One is what I'm calling the scan card, the institutional grid. This is a carefully coded PIN number of personal recognition in your city and within the IAAP. This institutional grid scan card allows you entry to all the analytic functions, gives you a qualification, it insists that you are registered, and it makes sure that you are competent as a professional psychologist, psychiatrist, analyst, therapist. But it's your institutional grid. It's the training you went through. It's the PDs you attend, like today. But it gives you a scan card, you know, an entry card. Without that, nothing much else happens. Then there's something else which is the basket stuff here, which is a sort of implicit mystery cult of which psychotherapy is a part. Now, I don't mean, you know, cult, this cult, you know, like nasty cults. I mean something which is a small group that has its understanding and its process of going through initiations, if you like, even though I don't necessarily like that, like consciousness, it's been a bit overdone. But analytical psychology and psychoanalysts do, in fact, belong to a sort of cult. It's, and it's related, in my mind, to the mystery cult in the sense of the mysteries of transformation and concentration of the mind, mindfulness, recognition also of Dionysos and the vitality of life. It's a sort of mystery cult. This refers, this, this section, this refers to the recognition key, the mystery cult, especially the pattern recognition of transformative processes of human and natural life that have been distilled into cults, if you like, the mysteries, such as elusives, such as the hidden traditions, 
such as the mystical lineages of Judaism, of alchemy, of Sufism, of Christianity, the kin and indigenous forms which somehow preserve a core of vitality in, in, in the Pinabi language, Kanyinjaku Kurumpa, the carrying of the spirit, the carrying of the fire. There, is, there are groups of men and women whose speciality is in carrying the fire and maintaining this sort of essence of the transformative processes. Some say that Jung's contribution to psychotherapy was to sink a well and to align a psychiatric school with the deeper structures of this perennial source of living water, to align and honor rather than assume and arrogantly denigrate the pre-rational, pre-scientific efforts of human beings to know ourselves. Then I refer, which is the bit I want to develop, what I'm referring to for myself as Tiresias' mind. And this refers to the metaphor of a particular kind of mental attitude and a mental capacity which may be valued by analytical psychologists who wish to prepare their minds for the road, for the disintegration, the cultural devastation as feared, anticipated, or the cultural facilitation which may come our way. This third task, or this third area of my little diagram, refers to what I'm going to call you know, in a rather silly way, the Tiresias chip. <coughs> this means, this refers to access to the mind of Tiresias, without which no analytical psychologist can operate in the real world across all the time frames of existence. Now, those of you who, who, who are familiar with Doctor Who, the Time Lord television series from Britain, can translate what I'm saying here and say it's not so much the Tiresias chip it's the time, it's the Doctor Who chip. The notion is that there are certain capacities built into the character of Tiresias, I'm going to explain what they are, which give us a metaphor, give me a metaphor. Doctor Who's not quite, quite up to it. Tiresias is better for me. Finally, I want to refer to what I'm calling the avataric constellation. Yet the word avatar has been popularized on the movies, but the, the original concept of it comes from Sanskrit, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It, it refers to the descent into human form of divine activity. Some people say, you know, God made incarnate. I think that's a very simplified way. I see it as the descent into a human form, that is the coming into a human form of a divine activity. This divine activity, generally referred to, is from the avatars of Vishnu in the, in the Indian tradition, is sent into a human form of the capacities to take car, care of, of humanity through teaching and activities. And so you find the descent of Vishnu, the preserver and protector, being embodied in Rama, Krishna, according to the tradition, Zoroaster, Buddha, Carpenter from Nazareth, the Camelier from um, Med Mecca and Medina, whose, whose body somehow emanates a kind of um, teaching or uh, protective or transitional phase. Now, one argues, can argue this or that, but the issue is to what extent is analytical psychology psychologists able to align themselves, you yourself, with the deep structures of the avataric constellations. And my argument to you would be that if you cut yourself loose from the great traditions as a psychotherapist, you will float in a dream time forever and be of no use. Provided, I would say, if we had time to discuss this, provided like the man, the father in the road in McCarthy's McCarthy, novel, what the father does he doesn't float in a dream time. He doesn't call on Jesus to save him. He doesn't call out and revile, you know, whoever sent the bonds. He just takes particular care every day. They've got enough water. They've got food if they can find it. He protects his son. He uses his gun very sparingly. He's only got two, three bullets. Somehow or other, they make the whole trip. Because he is able to operate a screwdriver, work out a wrench, undo something that he finds, 
fix a wheel, be attentive to the time, take care of the son, his, his little son here, look out for opportunities on the road all the time. Absolute meticulous craftsman attention to detail. So without the attention to the detail of the particular, identification with the avataric constellation is no use. So I'm urging attention, the potential of the attention to detail of the craftsmanship of analytical psychology and psychotherapy in conjunction with the deep structures of the avataric constellations and the teachings, whether you choose Buddha or whether you choose Zoroaster, it's the deep structure that counts. I want to go to Tyrese. Is that okay, Tom? Let me wind up. The thing about Tyrese is, those of, I hope everybody has some idea that there was a Greek play by Sophocles called Oedipus Rex. Remember Oedipus? Oedipus. No, he had a lot of trouble. And um, he was abandoned as a baby, you remember, because there was a prediction that when he grew up he'd kill his father, Laius. And Laius wasn't too keen on being killed by his kids, so he arranged for the boy to be exposed on the hillside. Remember the story? And the boy was exposed, but um, the man who was asked to expose him had compassion for the boy and <laughs> arranged a deal so that someone else could pick up the baby and the baby was taken to Corinth and adopted. Stolen, stolen generation in Australia by adoption. And uh, he grew up, remember, and then he met a man in a bar when he was young. And the, bar, the man in the bar room told him, so the story goes, that um, in fact uh, his father wasn't his father. And, or no, no, sorry, that there was a story that he was going to kill his father and everybody knew it but he. And that if he didn't want to kill his father, he'd better take off. So he took off. He left. He fled from Corinth to spare his father and ended up, as you know, on the road towards Thebes, and on the road towards Thebes he met a man who told him to get out of the way and he didn't like being told by an older man to get out of the way so they had a little fight and Oedipus hit him and that man was killed. Remember that story? Laius was killed and lo and behold he just killed his father but didn't know it. And you remember the rest of the story that he goes into Thebes, eventually he probably wandered around for a while, a bit upset maybe what had happened. We had some sort of post-traumatic trauma or something. But he ends up talking to this woman who's referred to as a sphinx and says, darling, you know, you want to go into town, but you've got to answer this question. You know, what is it that walks on four and then two and then three? And he said, that's easy. That's a human being. It was a dumb question. It's a very easy question. Mm -hmm. So they let, let um, Oedipus into town, you remember? And um, lo and behold, he'd answered the, this... this um, this riddle, and apparently if you could answer it, that would help lift the plague, the cultural devastation into which it was recurrently heir to, and, um, and, and, and the prize is um, marrying the queen. Remember that? So he marries the queen. And the mother apparently doesn't recognize her own son. Or did she? Who knows? This is a big question. But anyway, the, the, then he, he becomes the king. Then the play continues, this unresolved issue, this sort of Theban cultural complex rolls on and no one knows what to do with it. And Oedipus calls Tiresias, but he calls Tiresias, Tiresias, well, I need to explain to you in a minute, but he's like the, the, the kind of cultural advisor to Thebes and to the king. He's a sort of you know, therapist in a sense. And Tiresias says, well, look, you know, these, these you're asking me a question. The question is, you know, um, what has been told to you is that this plague will continue until the true murderer, the true killer of the King Laius is found. And Oedipus says, well, we've got to find this, this um, we've got to find, you know, we've got to expunge the deed. What the problem? And Tiresias says, well, I think you should, but I'd rather you didn't, because if you did, you might discover that the, 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 the result will be worse than yourself. And um, Oedipus, in, in Sophocles' fantastic play, have a debate about this. And Oedipus tells, um, and you'll be familiar with this, Oedipus tells um, Tiresias that he's obviously part of the conspiracy 
himself because he won't tell the, the truth. And Tiresias replies, well, there are perhaps some truths you shouldn't know. And um, this goes into a tyrannical rage and a kind of paranoid state. And um, eventually Tiresias has to um, reveal the story. But he does it in a very clever way. I think a good psychotherapy or psychotherapy technique. He doesn't actually tell him himself um, what the history is. He calls a witness, Shepherd, the man who carried the baby. And he also calls a witness to the murder, to the killing. And so it's through the witnesses who Tiresias um, arranges to come that Oedipus learns the history of his childhood and the killing and the consequences. And then, um, as you know, Eucasta is he in suicide and Oedipus is exiled, so it begins in the story. But the crucial character and the nature of the character in Sophocles is what I need to draw to your attention. The man on the edge of town, or the man on the edge, but who's nevertheless brought in to consult at crucial moments in, in the, in the city-state. I'm grateful for some of the elaborations on this to my good colleague in Australia, Dr. Glenda Clockley, who has written extensively on this whole issue of the Oedipal Triangle and its relationship to culture. I recommend your her work to I doubt if she's listening, but I can say that. Now, this is a few factors about Tiresias, what I call Tiresias' mind. Do you remember that Tiresias, as a seer uh, of the Greek time, um, and you see this in different mythological forms and different theatre performances and so on. But you, the core of it for me is this. That first of all, he belongs to an acknowledged, recognized trade, that of divination, originally. That's his original training as a diviner. You know, you slit open the, the intestines, you read the intestines, or there are various other forms of pre-rational, pre-scientific um, method which still exists. Central Australia and other places. Divination, that's his core training. And then on a particular day he sees one of the goddesses, the divine form, incarnation of one of the goddesses. There are different versions. Sometimes it's Aphrodite, sometimes it's the Huntress. Aphrodite, Huntress, you can argue which one, but the consequence is he sees a divine feminine form exposed in all of her nakedness bathing, and this makes an enormous impression on him. He has a sort of revelation. But the consequence of it is that the goddess herself turns him into a woman. So the consequence of having seen her in her naked um, presence is that he becomes female. You may remember that. So for a period of his life, he's female. Later on, he, he reverts. And so then he now has the experience, complete embodied experience of being a woman, being female, and of being male, and a diviner. And then Hera and um, Zeus have a big family fight. And he's called in as a sort of family advice, therapist, not exactly, but to mediate. Remember that? And the issue is Zeus is well known to have had sexual relationships of all sorts of forms, divine and, and human, and Hera is a bit tired of it. So one day she says to him, that's enough. And he replies to her, but Hera, my dear, you are a woman. So, she says, he says, well, can pity us poor males. In the sexual experience, the women have nine times more pleasure than the males. What rubbish, says Hera. And he says it's true. Of the ten parts of potential sexual pleasure, the men have one part and the women have nine. Well, we'll see about that, says Hera. Let's call Tiresias, because he's experienced both male and female sexuality, has he not? And Tiresias confesses that it's true that he has widened his experience and he has a full range of experience as a woman in all kinds of activities, including sexual. I don't think there's any mention of childbirth in the myth, but there might be, and, and as a male. So he's summoned. 
and he rather um, has found himself in a difficult position, Tom, would he not, to make this decision. He says, I have to say that Zeus is right. My experience has been that the woman has much more range of subtlety, more sensation, has more opportunity and range of pleasure than men, poor thing. And in fact, it is correct that the women's sensation, experience, of love and pleasure is greater than that of the men. Now, Zeus thinks this has vindicated his activities. But Hera considers that to be the wrong choice. And so, in consequence, Tiresias is struck blind. Do you remember? Now, there are various versions of what happens later. But later, it's, so it is said, that Hera relents um, after when she calms down. She doesn't take away his blindness, but she gives him much more greater gifts of intensity of sight, the capacity to see much more further, to see much more deeply. He becomes a true seer, in fact. And um, <coughs> such as there's one more point I want to make, which is time. Is it seems that 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 that, that um, Tiresias has a very long memory. He has a capacity for long memory. And if you remember that drawing that of Jung's about the memory that goes back to the original fire. My sense is that the way in which Tiresias is often seen in many of the plays and many of the myths, though he existed over perhaps a thousand years, this is the Doctor Who bit, the, the Time Lord who can travel from time and space. It seems to me that Tiresias is a kind of figure incarnation which encapsulates this idea of the capacity of human psyche to travel over time, deep, deep time. And I think you know Jung's notion of deep time in the psyche is probably you know, related to this Tiresias idea. What I'm saying to you in my last three minutes is that I feel that it's worth saying that, that the cultivation of the Tiresias mind is something which psychotherapists and psychoanalysts are already in the process of doing. And it's a quality, I think, which might be very useful to others not only for patients, but to others to, to, to contemplate. One is the capacity of the psycho of the analytic Tyrese mind to travel in time, to be attentive over long spaces of time, to have a long memory. The second is the flexibility of sexuality. That is to say, not only you know being homosexual, this sexual, that sexual, which is not what I mean. I actually mean the capacity to be to, to having embodied in your own experience as much as you can of the opposite gender, other gender, to be a, to be integrated as it were enough to be able to appear before Hera with confidence and say women have to go certain things and the men say. But it's really the bisexuality I'm referring to, the psychic bisexuality as a quality. The other is the capacity to be exposed to divine, you know, to the goddesses or whatever, but to the divine emanation, not flinch. That is, take it in, even if it means strange things happen to you. The fourth is, I think, or whatever it is, the capacity to be able to mediate between forces of great uh, intensity, whether it's Hera, represents, to some extent, social order and the maintenance of social order, and the fertile kind of male creation, or whatever it might be, or between destruction and protection, or preservation and creation. But there are enormous forces in the world and in people's lives. And it's the capacity to mediate and tell the truth, even if it gets you into trouble, to some extent. So I think the other has to do with this cultivation of the capacity for kind of insight. And my last comment is to refer to the alpha function. And this is um, Wilfred Bion's notion of alpha function, a beautiful concept um, that comes out of psychoanalysis. Alpha function being our capacity as human beings to gather diverse bits of experience and somehow or other form it, allow it to sit and nest and incubate, and form into a from which then we can move to a formulation or an action or an interpretation. 
and the capacity, the enhanced capacity, the alpha function of the psychotherapist, and how we do that is something I think of value to humanity wherever we meet humans in, in, a, in our particular role. So my formula I'm bringing to you, I think, is next. I hope it's still there. I don't know what's happened. That's the wedding. I, I lost my formula. I forget. Now, it might come next. Just give me, just go on a bit. Go back, I'm going to come back to the, Tom had the formula. Never mind, you don't even have to see it. I'm sorry, people on the web. There's the formula. Now, we made this up. I mean, I made this up, so I take responsibility. This is called the hypothetical formula for survival or mental preparation. Uh, and it's called Tiresias mind. So there's all the qualities of the Tiresias mind. Plus transformative factors. That is, whether it's the elusive, you know, mystery or whatever, I just love the notion, plus transformative factors, plus or minus, or divided by your analytical institutional grid. Now, your institutional grid can add to your Tiresias mind and your, tra your transformative factors, or it can divide it and split it, split it off, or it can diminish it. This is my challenge to all of us who are involved in training. I've been a co-chair of training in Australia and I'm involved in as a training analyst. I believe if we are able to maintain our training institutions so that, so that we don't divide and split off the transformative factors in the Tiresias mind, then that's okay. But if it becomes only an institutionalized grid with an interest in insurance, registration, appearance, reputation, how many books you've published and how many patients you have, then that's it. Political psychology is stuffed. And then I've multiplied it by the individual alpha function. Um, sorry, and to the power of the avataric constellation. Now, this really sounds silly, but what I mean is that, that an individual who can be linked into an avataric constellation, a deep tradition, a, a, a perennial teaching, is not floating only in a kind of individualized world. But I think that stabilizes the practitioner. I don't mean religious fundamentalism. I mean sunk into a, to the appropriate cultural constellation. And this individual alpha function capacity, this is something that we have, you know, it's, it's for me to maintain, it's for Tom to maintain. It's your own capacity to integrate, just to, to remain clear-minded and psychically capable. So, there's the hypothetical formula, and somebody is going to, I'm not quite sure, somebody else is going to have to explain this and then win the prize or something. But anyway, I'll leave it at that because it's now time. And I'd like to show you the final slides to wind us up. Here we go, there's a slide of a wedding. It's slide 41. I'm showing you this because of the particular. So there's a wedding in Melbourne. It's a hybrid situation. There is the bride is from an Armenian refugee family who spent two generations on the road from Armenia through Istanbul to Greece and eventually to Melbourne. And marrying my son. So there's a combination in Australia. You don't see the sun because that's the women only room. But the, my two daughters are there, the two pretty little girls. The point is all of us are engaged, I think, in this moving together of cultures in one form or another. And the future of the world seems to be some sort of hybrid, whether it's a conjunction of the Armenians and the Anglo-Saxons or what. Here's another, what I think, a typical hybrid woman of the present. She is bicycling in a street in Holland. She's on her way to the um, Max Planck Institute of Psycholinguistics. She's a specialist in languages from a small tribal group in Papua New Guinea. But the Max Planck Institute gave her the opportunity to complete the grammar and the translation discourses of, of this pure group who wanted their language written down and grammified so they could counteract mining claims. 
is to say you could demonstrate ownership if you could demonstrate in your language that you own that area against the mining company, for better or worse. So, but without the language translated into English, the mining company anthropologists couldn't make a judgment as to who owned that small area. So they set going this project, working with an Australian university to translate the language, to write a grammar, to get a dictionary, and to write down the cultural histories which would prove and this was done. To me, this is a good example of the conjunction of cultures to preserve and protect. And here we are, though, Holland and a young woman of something, 30 years old, in the midst of these conditions. And finally, my last image, I call this Dante's nest. Here is a little bird. It's a beautiful woven death, um, nest, you see that? Which it's woven into a, the fragments of a destroyed metal substance, like some an old um, tractor or something, sitting there keeping creation going. The nest, the bird, the egg, God knows what sort of future. Thank you. sort of spotty fashion, Tom. Mike, it's not, we're not using that. It's actually not. Can you hear me now? Better. It may be that when there's background noise, that's when we're getting an interrupted signal, if you can keep mindful of that. We would like to invite comments and questions, and, and I, please. So from the webinar group first, or from the floor here? How about from there in the room to begin? All right. Tom, would you like to mediate or invite? Uh, and then we'll... Good. It's, uh, it's closest to the mic. You can only address a tiny bit of the app. Uh, My name is Tom Moorhead. I'm from Berkeley. Um, I can only address a bit of the last talk. So, Hugh, when you spoke of different times that we live in, I work in a political health clinic, but we continue to have cultural competence trainings. And one of them has been brought again and again. It's called the post slavery trauma syndrome. And the presenters are not in the same time zone, I mean. and it reminds me of the people who have been traumatized who say, I was traumatized 10 years ago, and the, the, the perpetrator who says, get over it, get into the present, come here now, or something like that. Well, now in these trainings we're talking about 400 years this, and your talk helped me to understand what they were saying to us in our 
training for them working with these people. So just to thank you. Mr. Very, thank you for reiterating. Actually, I, I want to respond because Craig really helped me with this because I took the assignment of the future analytical psychology of the world sort of literally. Where are we now and where are we going and where are our images? I got linear with it, which I'm really glad I did. But then the first thing I saw with Craig's drawing from Spencer was that he blew the whole thing open so that the whole past, present, future got highly relativized. And I actually think it's worth keeping both in mind. We are in a world that is increasing glo increasingly globalized with all these forces that I defined. And there's this whole other dimension of how individuals and cultures carry very separate uh, past, present, and future. They're both true. And so the, the post-slavery traumatic time is a perfect example of, of that kind of um, complexity. And I think, Craig, if I can speak for you, Craig's point is that the analyst, the analytic point of view, is to be able to sit and somehow be flexible enough to mediate between all these separate times. The, the time we're in right now, we are sitting here, and what we imagine for the collective future of the globe then this, all this other time, too. That's an, I mean, I don't know who could do that, actually. Thank you. Tom, may I just um, dovetail on that question and comment and ask Craig regarding what those of us who are probably very uninformed refer to as dream time among the Aboriginal peoples of Australia. Uh, that has often, from far, struck me as uh, a, a wonderful notion of being able to be fluid and flexible, and that image of Rod of Rod Moss's um, painting, in which you see this reversal of of characters, um, also spoke to that same idea you were talking about of the institutional boundaries not being too firmly fixed. Where um, here the native healer is uh, analyzing the dream. Are we right to think that? There's something unique that, that that idea of dream time might offer to us in understanding this? That's, I think that's a very fertile question, and I do... I have found that getting to understand how the so-called dream time or Jukupa um, operates in terms of mental relation to place and to time, the configuration of time, I have found that to be very instructive. It has altered my own mind about time and space. Uh, and I, it's a fruitful line for analytical psychology and psychotherapy to pursue. I don't, don't think we should do that now, but, but you've tagged it, and it's a good tag to make. Thank you. That, uh, my name's Elizabeth Lewis. I'm from San Francisco. And your, your question sort of tells with my, uh, with my comment, which is, um, I, when we speak of past, present, and future, that's that's linear time. It's a river, and I don't know if it's the same as stream time, but the other time of time I visualize it as a, a, a pond. You don't go anywhere; you just swim around in it. And people with post-traumatic stress disorder, their river's been dammed up and polluted. That's why they're, they're stuck swimming around there. But most traditional cultures that. It's it's a pond. There's no place to go. You just swim around it, and um, you can't. To me, you can't be in both states. You can oscillate between the two states, but you you can't be in both at the same time. The other thing about linearity is when you start writing things down, like your hybrid was doing, uh, you, you move the thinking into a, a linear sequential thinking and. Uh, sometimes the memory of the images is lost. Uh, uh, I won't. I could give you some examples of that, but maybe that's too far. But there, uh, actually, there's a in certain Indian cultures, the memory is carried of uh, the, the family and the culture is carried by uh, poets or who who have memorized this long. Uh, 
terms of who is from who and who is from who, and uh, they carry the history in their, their memory, which they recite at festivals. And someone got the great idea of, let's write all this down, so, uh, and then they'll have it, uh, you know, we can translate it. So they taught these, these people how to, read, how to read and write, and they started writing it down. But uh, once they wrote it down, they couldn't remember it anymore. They lost the song, the poetry that uh, carried that on. So. Anyway. And the, the woman on the bicycle uh, in Papua New Guinea, in what's works with what's called sung poetry, and and that that same issue is there, the recording and the memory and how it's maintained. Because it's a very important line. Say we're doing this. Does anyone else? You have to come up, please. How's the women are people doing? Is that okay? Do you need, is there anyone to come in from there? We do have a question for you, Craig, very specifically about if you could just reiterate what was the fourth quality of um, Tiresias' mind? I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> then we shouldn't feel badly either. <laughs> he wrote it down, so he forgot it. I forgot it. <laughs> Uh, the if it's the final one, it's this individual alpha function, the capacity of an individual, thank you, to, to integrate um, of experience and formulate it into a pattern. Um, thank you. Based on Wilfred Brown's notion of alpha in his work. Thank you. I have another guest here to speak. My name is Louise Jackson. Both of your, your talks really um, brought up a lot of memories of a kind of maybe prototype or I don't know what to call it, but experiences in my life as a therapist when there were notions like this floating around long before there were was old civilization when we know really that was having to integrate many things. And one of the first ones was when I was very young, I was Lincoln Hospital in the South Bronx. And it was during the time of the war on poverty. And with that war on poverty came the realization that therapists were in their working offices too much. And they should now, in the war on poverty, go out into the community and study network support, networks of the poor. And so in the South Bronx, my job, I wasn't a psychologist, I was somebody's assistant. I had even a degree at was to go to, it was African American and Puerto Rican then, go to the drum and bugle corps in the African American section, and the curandadas, the, the ceremonies, which was the support system, study that. Fabulous job. And that went on for, for a number of years, but nothing ever really came of it. It just sort of went really, really, really well. People were being trained in the hospital on the culture of the poor, I mean, for mental health professionals. They were encouraged to go into people's houses, right? and, and it was sort of a little mini version of what's going on now. Second time, in Moran County, San Rafael, working the school for emotionally disturbed kids, the immigrants came in in the canal area, and we went from Marin language, English, white, to 15 different languages within a number of years. And then, I can't resist that, which is very, you know, like I work with so many ethnically diverse people, and I had to change the way I spoke to them. I had to become much more metaphor, and I, I'm just going to use one example. One day in a Vietnamese couple, I couldn't say things like, you just trust your husband's will, or whatever. I had to say things like, and I can remember, your nest is broken. And then I could they could hear, I could, you know. So my final point is, it's just nice to hear this, what's happening now, I mean, the necessity. It's making people very creative, I think, in a sense. But I just want to add one more dimension to this, what this new age, not new age, but, you know, Dr. Who said this, I love it. 
I have to have. To read your stuff to the world. Curiosity. Curiosity. Number one on my list, you have to really want to know what another culture is. You have to really know why they eat them, why they like them. You have to know, it might say, hey, I don't know that it, it has to be fascinating. You have to be curious. Okay, I think she gets full prize. She definitely gets the, yeah, she gets the pomegranate prize. <laughs> We have another um, guest ready. Good morning. Thank you. Um, my name is Mary Webster. I'm a cultural artist and a writer. Um, I'm struck. Most recently, the failure of the language to get at what we are talking about, because of course we live in a time where multiple languages um, don't always overlap. And so we have to get the these language. Um, listening to each of you, there are two images. The idea of the Quora. Thinking about that, the image that came to me was a very large, dark skinned woman with her eyes closed, swaying. like this, and that um, she was an avatar of the fire, absolutely connected to the fire as the original place, the place of origin. And unless we go back to that place of origin, which actually is transpersonal and not even human, we can't remake the world. The second image came out of a tunnel speaking, and it was the trickster image, I don't know whether you even saw, within the computer field. And what came onto the screen here was Norton Security. <laughs> Norton is a person in enormous corporation. And I thought to myself when I saw that, well, what is it that's interfering with our efforts? It was the trickster, not of your doing, that appeared in the middle of our efforts. And that's what we have to deal with. That's the resistance. That's beautiful. I, I, I want to respond to the fire, the, the dark woman uh, sway who takes things back to the central fire because that's actually at the base of Jung's diagram of the psyche, is the central fire. And there's an image that I showed, uh, it was sort of, I said this is Jung's version of the call of life, and sort of a cosmic age. We don't have it in front of us, but at the bottom it's very fiery. And all these primitive forms are emerging. And I actually think when you say that's what we have to go back to, that's what I have in mind with some modern Eleusinian mystery that we all get initiated into where we're taken because life itself is threatened. That's the deal, I think. That's my thank you for your image. Should you get something? Yes. yes. What about the two pairs? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, we've got five minutes. Tom, is there time for one question from the webinar participants? Yes. yes. Uh, we have somebody who's asked, how can ritual or ceremony help to create Tiresias mind, create Chorus space, both for the analyst, uh, therapist, um, personally, and for the client? And do you use ceremony in your practice? Uh, that's a very um, Pertinent question, and, I, and I, I'll just say this, that in those cultures that I know of where ceremony is, continues to be practiced, 
then ceremony has, has a, a way of engaging all of one's sensate being, the rhythm, the dance, the memory of the song, the presentation of the song, and a kind of, um, I'm not sure we call it, a sort of participation. Maybe it's, you know, participation mystique. And that effective ceremony, as I've either seen it or participated in it, has, has a kind of um, deep structure, fire, as it were, in it, and usually a fire is present. So, so that form continues. M my caution is, is about the invention of ceremony in situations where there is not a continuation or a knowledge of, this, of ceremony. And, and I'm, you know, I've taken part in the invention of ceremonies too. And I, and I also think that there is a, a, a future for real bipartisan ceremonial activities between people of different cultures. But my own experience is that it has to be developed carefully and sensitively with the right sort of language and it cannot be, as it were, imposed because it's a, it, it seems to be a good idea. You, you know, or, Clark, I, oh, or ahead, uh, if the tricksters involved, uh, we created a ceremony today with the basket that was totally, uh, it was imagined within the last 48 hours. And it's a lot, and it's real, and it's fun, and it's creative. And it touches everybody. So there is a place where ceremony can emerge spontaneously that is um, kind of transformative in its own funky way. Yeah, I'm all for funky ceremony, too. <laughs> and now we have one more uh, guest. And it's probably, probably the wind-up then. So, dear sir, could you? Mm -hmm. He actually just wants one of these. Um, things out of the basket. <laughs> what, what can I say? <laughs> Man, speaking the truth. Anyway, um, my main question comes from this call for expanded consciousness on the part of the culture at large. I mean, I'm a fledgling in the young end circle. However, the problem I see most often arising is that we young ends get so caught up in this large pool of gnosis that it tends to act as the devour of mouth and mother, and we get trapped in our own little pool off to the side of the larger community. Now, based on that, how do we make a connection with that larger community? And that, I see it as entering into a, seeing itself as more of a community in itself, and more of a James Hillman and Charles Escher manner of seeing it. Um, but also making it more available to the larger public, because I mean, right now I have such difficulty affording the psychotherapy that I go through that I can hardly meet up with my therapist even once a week in my strange circumstances. And that, I mean, based on the fact that it's so close socioeconomically, socioculturally, that it's not able to spread to a wider audience and therefore a wider audience is able to gain a larger gnosis. So, how do we go ahead and open that up? And I mean, the Episcopalian Church that I'm a part of is already teaching to do this. I know they have um, a student from the Pacific Graduate Institute there who's um, working with people at the church on like gospel Thomas and that type of thing in order to gain that insight into um, the psyche. However, um, whenever someone tries to do this, it eventually forms into a dogma where that internal aspect is taken out. So, I mean, first question on my part, I guess, is do you guys agree with my analysis of this issue within the Indian field? And second of all, if you do, how do we solve that future dilemma of running into that problem and answer drawing it back to uh, a lot less of this internal spirit? <laughs> Thank you. Well, <laughs> we just we just gave our friend here another vegetable in the basket. <laughs> it's an artichoke, a beautiful artichoke, which you have to cook and then peel each question one by one for many years. <laughs> so I would say 
to, to that, that this, this is exactly the question that uh, Jonathan Lear in his book places and Immanuel Kant and now you are placing it. These are questions of philosophical investigation that are going to take many years to answer. But what can I hope, as Kant says? What can I know and what will I do about it? I, I hope you'll come back in a year or two and give some answers to that in terms of your relation with the institutional grid of analytical psychology. I, I want to make just one comment because I felt like your um, really lovely thoughts uh, reminded me, took me right back to the drawing of Spencer's because the, the community convened to talk about what to do about the young people. And so that you come up here at the end and say, what are you doing about the young people uh, is just perfect. And you know what? I, don't, I think we're like Spencer, it's sort of in chaos. And we don't know what to do about the young people. And we don't know what the future brings, I think. Or what it'll cost. I have ideas, and I'll save them. <laughs> 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 well, folks, it's now 12.30, and I think that's our agreed uh, Sorry, 1.30, it's our agreed time to conclude. Is that, is that correct? To the web, to the web people? Uh, Lynn and thank Billy, you are both. you still there? Um, we are, and thank you both very much. I'll tell you that we've already received a handful, of a dozen or more comments gratitude for the Good. Well, we hope we can continue this. It was, it was fun. And I actually think your presence brings a lot to us. I think it gives a kind of um, energy and urgency and uh, sense that we're being heard. I think it's so thank you very much. Thank you, guys. It was great. Thank you very much. For those on the webinar, we're going to sign off now. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.